Welcome to a brand new episode of Citizen Detective. I'm one of your hosts, Mike Morford. My friends call me Morph. I host or coast several true crime podcasts, including Criminology, The Murder of My Family, Missing Persons, Zodiac Speaking. And we also want to let people know up front, we have a lot of Bob Ruff fans coming over for this episode. So thank you for coming over. We're happy to have you here. I want to give you a heads up that you can leave us a voicemail at any time for this episode or any episode we cover by going to speakpipe.com slash citizen detective. You can leave a voicemail. We may play it on the air. Uh, and just a quick reminder for everyone that wants to find out about the podcast, the cases we're covering, past episodes, things like that, head over to citizendetectivepodcast.com. And with that, I'm going to turn you over to Alex. Thanks, Morph. I'm Alex Ralph, researcher and writer for Citizen Detective and sometimes the doc show, Murder Was the Case. I'm a law grad with 15 years experience in criminal law. I've worked both uh, prosecution and defense in homicides and other uh, crimes like sexual assault. I want to remind everyone once again where you can find us every two weeks. We are live on YouTube, twitch.tv slash citizen detective, twitter.com slash citizen dpod, and facebook.com slash citizen detective podcast. Lee, over to you. Hi, I'm Dr. Lee Miller, a.k.a. Doc Murder. Sometimes I mess up, I say Dr. Lee Murder. It's crazy. I am the author of seven books. I am the former vice president and head of behavioral for the American Investigative Society of Cold Cases. I'm always consulting on cold cases. Got a whole new batch coming in. Um, I uh, What else? I, I'm the host of Murder Was the Case, that Alex mentioned too. And I want to encourage you all to go to patreon.com, citizen detective, and become a member of the DDA, the Digital Detective Agency. And what you get for that? Well, hopefully in the future, quite a lot. Right now, you get to come uh, to our scrum, which is like an after hours for Citizen Detective, where we chew the fat a bit more, talk about things that we didn't get to in the main show. So I hope that was appealing. Uh, a bit about the show, I think, we, because we have so many new people here, Morph and Alex, I think it would help them to know a bit about the format. I'll say that uh, what we want to do initially is get everyone up to speed with the facts we know that some of you will know the case already and some of you will have no idea whatsoever the discussion is not going to do anything for those people that don't know anything whatsoever uh because they're just going to be lost so the first half an hour sometimes up to 40 minutes is just recapping all of the facts of the case alex does the research and writing for it she's fantastic then after that we open things up i'm going to give my opinion uh, which is uh, my, my professional um, analysis based on my education and experience. Then we're going to get uh, Susanna Ryan and Cloyd Steiger on. Susanna Ryan is a DNA analyst. She's great at this, and she's here almost every week. Cloyd Steiger is a retired Seattle homicide investigator. He solved about 250 murders. And then we have our guest come on. And today that guest is Bob Ruff, who we're very much looking forward to hanging out with. And uh, it's West Memphis 3. And comments. We want your comments. So send them. We will address as many as we can, particularly any interesting ones. And uh, as Morph said, you can uh, leave us voicemail messages too. And uh, we, we get very few of those. So we want to change that. And it always makes the show more interesting. So send them in. All right. West Memphis 3. I think we actually have one comment first that Morph was going to read for us. Okay. And this is uh, some news about Oklahoma. Um, now, this is coming from Steve D. And he says, great news about Oklahoma. I actually live in Northeast Oklahoma. Crazy fact. My best friend's sister was in the same Girl Scout troop as the murdered girls. Uh, the troop was from Tulsa, and her mother drove her to catch the bus to Locust Grove, where the camp is located, and she got sick at the last minute and couldn't go, and the rest is history. I doubt this is one of the cold cases, though. Yes, Hart was found not guilty, but recent DNA test proved he was the killer. He was an escaped convict at the time, hiding in a cave near the campsite. Items from the camp were found in the cave, including glasses belonging to one of the victims. He died in prison back in the 80s. I thought of a couple of other cases you might want to cover. They might be in your files. And But the I-40 murders, in my mind, is probably someone that's a long-haul trucker who's a perpetrator. The Morgan Nick case in Alma, Arkansas, and she was tragically abducted at a baseball field right under her mother's nose and presu presumably murdered. Uh, and then 
also in Oklahoma, the Dreams of Ada case, a woman who was abducted from a convenience store and murdered. And not all that interesting other than the fact that the wrong guys were locked up for the crime. And then anyway, if you guys come down here, I'll be happy to take some days off and show you around and buy beers. So thank you, Steve D. Uh, just uh, listeners, uh, be aware that we're going to be covering some Oklahoma cases because we have an in that's asked us to help shed some light on these cases. I don't know if you want to just expound on that a little bit, Alex. Yeah, we were contacted by a prosecutor in Oklahoma. I'm not going to give a lot of the details out quite yet, but she is the director of the cold case unit now um, for her county. And they have a series of about 17 unsolved disappearances and or murders. And their sheriff's office is more than willing to enlist the help of shows like this and people like Lee and Cloyd and Susanna to help them get these cases solved. So we're waiting for information to come in so we can give you a good rundown on what these cases, um, who they are, what happened. And as soon as we have that, we'll bring that to you. And it should be a really exciting series. Yeah. So the exciting part is that we're going to be working on actual unsolved cases with the police and the prosecutor. So we're getting the files, all that. We won't be able to release all the information. We're still going to have to talk to them about what we can and can't release. But this is more a uh, reason to join the DDA because I know there's a lot of web sleuths out there. And, you know, you can actually be working on a real investigation. Uh, who knows what we'll have you looking into, but it'd be fantastic if you could. And we are going back to Arkansas. This is our second visit. We looked at the Texarkana Moonlight Murders, but today we are looking at probably Arkansas's most infamous unsolved case. That is the triple murders of Christopher Byers, of Stephen Branch, and of Michael Moore, known as the West Memphis Three case, but not for those West Memphis Three. But with that, let's just get into it. On Wednesday, May 5th, 1993, three little boys left school on a warm spring day. They spent the afternoon riding bikes around their neighborhood. When the sun went down and none of the boys returned home, the parents reported them missing. Police searched a nearby patch of woods where the kids liked to play. The search continued until the early morning hours. The next afternoon, police found the boys' bound bodies submerged in a creek. All three were beaten about the head and one boy was injured in a most ghastly way. A dark theory developed quickly. The murders were part of a satanic cult ritual. Within days, police, police focused their attention on three teenagers who stood out in the small homogenous community. With no direct evidence linking them to the crimes, the state successfully prosecuted the teenagers now known as the West Memphis Three. The two received life sentences and one was sentenced to death. They were released after 18 years in prison and the Mes West Memphis Three still fight to be exonerated. The case inspired the Free the West Memphis Three movement na nationwide. Through four documentaries, a book, and a motion picture, the campaign raised money to assist in proving the innocence of Damian Eccles, Jesse Miss Kelly, and Jason Baldwin. Most believe that the convictions of the West Memphis Three represent an egregious miscarriage of justice, a real-life witch hunt born of an unholy trinity of superstition, ignorance, and panic. Some maintain that the West Memphis Three are guilty. They argued that the evidence was strong and the police work solid. Tonight, we present you with a condensed version of the case, and we're really looking forward to hear what you think. Our panel, of course, includes retired homicide, Detective Cloyd Steiger and Susanna Ryan, lab director of Pure Gold Forensics. We are also very excited to have Bob Ruff join us tonight. Bob covered the West Memphis Three in season five of his podcast, Truth and Justice. Bob is a former fire chief and a seasoned investigator. His coverage of cases is exhaustive, thorough, and professional. His efforts have contributed to the release of at least one wrongfully incarcerated individual. We have a ton of information to cover tonight, so let's just get right into it. Memphis is a small southern town in Crittenden County, Arkansas. It's directly across from Memphis, Tennessee on the Mississippi River. The population of West Memphis is less than 30,000 people, 65% of whom are African-American. West Memphis takes its religion seriously. Nearly 100 churches serve the 28-square-mile town. For West Memphians, God is as real as a heart attack, and so is the devil. 
Robin Hood Hills or Robin Hood Woods is a small patch of hardwood trees, no bigger than a football field, according to Bob Ruff. Ten Mile Bayou runs along the south side and Interstate 55 runs along the north, about 50 feet away. On the west side, less than 50 feet away, is the Blue Beacon Truck Wash. To the east is a large wheat field. Kids play in the Robin Hood woods during the day, but it's no place for children to be at night. In the dark, the patch of woods plays host to transients, truckers, and illegal activity. Wednesday, May 5th, 1993 was a typically southern spring day with temperatures in the mid-80s. The atmosphere was oppressive at night due to the combination of heat, humidity, and mosquitoes. Stevie Branch, Michael Moore, and Christopher Byers were second graders at Weaver Elementary in West Memphis. Stevie was eight years old with blonde spiky hair, blue eyes, and glasses. He lived at 1601 South Macaulay Drive with his mother and stepfather, Pam and Terry Hobbs, and his four-year-old sister, Amanda. The backyard of Stevie's house was about 150 feet from the edge of 10 Mile Bayou. Stevie was a typical little boy. He had a pet turtle and a dog named King. He was a huge fan of Teenage Mutant Ninja, Ninja Turtles, an honor student, and a Cub Scout. Michael Moore lived with his parents, Todd and Dana Moore, and his nine-year-old sister, Dawn. The Moores lived next door to the Weaver Elementary at 1398 East Barton. Michael was a cute kid with brown hair and big brown eyes. He was a loyal and devoted Cub Scout who wore his uniform at every opportunity. In fact, on the day in question, Michael was wearing his Scout shirt, his scarf, and his cap as he played with his friends. Christopher Byers lived across the street from Michael at 1400 East Barton. Chris lived with his mother and father, Melissa and John Mark Byers, and his 13-year-old brother, half-brother, Ryan. 36-year-old John Byers, known as Mark, was a looming man at 6 foot 8 inches and 238 pounds. A jeweler by trade, by 1993, Mark Byers had a criminal history that included domestic violence, drugs, and dealing in stolen goods. Occasionally, Mark acted as a police informant in investigations of local drug crimes. Mark adopted Chris when he was four. Chris was a sweet kid, but he was hyperactive, and he was often in trouble with his parents. Chris was not a Cub Scout like Stevie and Michael. He wanted to be, but he was never able to get his permission slip in on time. On May 5th, Weaver Elementary School let out at 2.45. Pam Hobbs picks Stevie up from school and Michael walked home. And we have no information about Chris's after school activities. When Michael got home, he asked his mother if he could ride bikes with Stevie. Dana Moore gave, her, gave him permission and told her son to be home when the streetlights came on. He was very pleased, and Michael rode the quarter mile to Stevie's house. At 3.30, Michael arrived at Stevie's house. Stevie's grandpa gave him a cool new bike two weeks before, and he wanted to show it off. Stevie asked Pam if he could ride bikes with Michael. Pam agreed, but told him to be home before she had to go to work at 5 p.m. Stevie promised his mom he would return on time and headed out with his buddy. Melissa and Mark Byers told Chris to come home straight after school. Mark had to take Chris's brother, Ryan, to a court appearance in town. After that, he had to pick up Melissa from work, come home, then pick Ryan up at 6 p.m. Mark and Melissa thought Chris was too young to have his own key, so he was supposed to wait in the carport until Ryan got home. At 4 o'clock, Chris still wasn't home. Mark and Ryan looked around the neighborhood for him, but they had to leave for court. At 4, Chris showed up at Stevie Branch's house. Pam told him the boys had already left on their bikes. Pam let Chris in, and he stayed for about 15 minutes. Pam claimed that he was headed home when he left. At 5.20, Mark and Melissa came home to find Chris on a skateboard, riding on his stomach in the middle of 14th Street, paying no attention to traffic. Chris was really in for it now. Mark struck Chris a few times with his belt and told him to clean up the carport. After that, Mark left to pick Ryan up at the courthouse. Chris left his house again at around 4, 5.30 p.m. Between 5.45 and 6, he stopped at Bobby Posey's house a couple of blocks west. There, Bobby claimed Chris told him, quote, Daddy had whipped him and that he was running away. Three people saw Michael and Stevie enter the woods in Robin Hood Hills. 15-year-old Ben Crafton saw the duo head north on Wilson Street toward Goodwin on the way to Robin Hood Hills. At 5.30, Deborah Odinger saw Michael and Stevie riding their bikes in her backyard. 
Odinger lived at 1309 Goodwin Street, across the street from Robin Hood Hills. Around the same time, Kim Wilson watched the boys go into the woods. At 6.30, Jamie Clark Ballard saw all three boys playing by a ditch in by 10 Mile Bayou in her backyard. Ballard lived three doors down from Stevie Branch on South Macaulay Drive. Shortly after, Jamie and her sister Brandy left home to attend a church group. As they started to leave, they saw the boys run between some houses toward the street. Knowing his parents were looking for him, Jamie yelled at Stevie to get home. Stevie shouted back, I don't have to listen to you, and took off. Jamie saw Stevie's stepfather, Terry Hobbs, come outside, and she heard him yell, You boys better get back down here. The boys ignored him and sped down the street. Terry was yelling after them to get back home. Fifteen minutes later, Jeff Martins saw the boys go into the Robin Hood woods. At seven o'clock, 19-year-old Chris Wall's father picked him up from his night school class. On the way home, Wall saw Chris Byers on the back of Stevie's bike, heading north on Macaulay Street toward the pipe bridge in the bayou by the woods. Wall, boo no Wall knew both boys and recognized them instantly. The pipe bridge led to a location known by locals as Turtle Hill or Turtle City. In general, West Memphis kids didn't play in Turtle City. It was too dangerous. Interstate 55 brought a litany of itinerant drivers to the Blue Beacon truck wash and nearby truck stop, and the risks were just too high. Moreover, the area was dark and scary, and the creek waters were filled with enormous snapping turtles eager to take a bite out of human flesh. Walls was the last confirmed sighting of Stevie, Michael, and Chris. We should note that there are two significant gaps in the boys' timeline. Chris's whereabouts between 2.45 and 4 p.m. are unknown. Also unknown is where Stevie and Michael were between 3.30 and 5 o'clock. Stevie's parents were the first to suspect that something was wrong when Stevie didn't return home by 5 as promised. Terry Hobbs drove Pam to work at 5. At 9, he picked Pam up and told her that Stevie hadn't come home. Mark Byers started to worry shortly before 7 when he returned from the courthouse and Chris hadn't returned. Mark, Melissa, and Ryan drove around town trying to find their son. At 7, Mark spotted a police officer and asked for help. The officer told him to wait another two hours, then call police if Chris didn't come home. At 8, Mark called police again. Officer Regina Meeks responded to the buyer's home at 8.10 and took the report. A few minutes later, Officer Meeks departed and responded to a call at the Bojangles restaurant. At approximately 8.30 p.m., Employees at Bojangles reported an African-American male who came into the restaurant covered in blood. The man went into the woman's bathroom, where he stayed for some time. Employee Marty King testified at trial that he went into the bathroom and found the man blood dripping from his forearms. He had mud on his feet and was disoriented. After he left, employees checked the bathroom. They found a blood-soaked toilet paper roll, and blood and feces were smeared on the walls and floor. Officer Meeks arrived at Bojangles at 8.50 p.m. She never entered the restaurant to investigate. Instead, she drove around the building to the drive through window. She listened to what the employees had to say about the incident, but never took a formal report. Meeks then left to respond to the call about the missing Michael Moore. What happened to the man is known as Mr. Bojangles is unknown. Meeks testified at trial that she never made a connection between the bloody man and the disappearance of the three boys. Inspectors Mike Allen and, and Brinridge came to the Bojangles at May, on May 6th to further investigate the incident. They took the description of the man and blood scrapings from the bathroom wall. Inspector Ridge testified that these blood samples were never sent to the crime lab for testing. When asked what happened to the samples, Ridge testified that he lost them. Dana Moore was the last of the parents to call police. Dana wasn't concerned about Michael until 8 p.m. that night. As we mentioned, Officer Meeks responded to the Moore residence after leaving Bojangles. The West Memphis police searched Robin Hood Hills and found no sign of the boys. They did not, however, cross the pipe bridge and search the woods on the other side. Officer Meeks got close, but she stated that the mosquitoes were so thick she was breathing them in. Based on that, she didn't believe that the boys would have gone across. Police stopped searching at 2 a.m., hoping daylight would illuminate the dark woods. The next morning, police and volunteers conducted a shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder, shoulder -shoulder search of the Robin Hood woods. They did the same in the woodsy area of Turtle Hill. A helicopter search began around noon. 
Aerial photos were taken of Robin Hood Hills and Turtle Hill, and still there was no sign of Stevie, Michael, and Chris. Eighteen hours after they disappeared, the three little boys were nowhere to be found. Around one o'clock on May 6th, inspectors Ridge and Allen were searching along a bank of a ditch that ran through the woods near Turtle Hill. The ditch was on the north side of the pipe bridge, down a path about 30 or 40 feet. In the ditch was a muddy creek that emptied into 10 Mile Bayou. At the time, the ditch contained two or two and a half feet of 60 degree water that was so thick and opaque, Bob Ruff described it as a mixture of chocolate milk and mud. There was only about an inch of visibility from the surface of the water. Searchers had been through the, ever, through the area several times and they found nothing. At 1.15, Steve Jones, an assistant juvie officer for Crittenden County, found a black tennis shoe floating in the creek where the woods opened at the Blue Beacon truck wash. 15 minutes later, inspectors Ridge and Allen were about to give up their search when Allen spotted two small tennis shoes floating near the opposite bank. Allen saw the shoes from about 10 to 15 feet above the water. He got in the water and crossed the creek. As he approached the shoes, he felt an object against his leg. He raised his right foot and found the body of a small nude boy floated to the surface. The boy was bound, his hands and legs tied behind him. Allen pulled the body onto the bank and secured the scene with yellow crime scene tape. The boy was Michael Moore. Inspector Ridge organized a grid search of the creek. Moving downstream, searchers waited, sweeping the dark water with their arms. A few feet down, they found a stick jammed into the creek bed. A shirt was wrapped around the stick. As they went, they found more sticks wrapped with more clothing. A branch lay across the water downstream from the clothing. The branch caught two white tennis shoes, a black tennis shoe, and a blue Boy Scout cap. 27 feet downstream from Michael Moore, officers found Stevie Branch. Five feet further down was Chris Byers. All three boys were naked, their wrists bound to their feet. The left side of Stevie's face was covered in blood and cuts. Michael and Chris were in similar shape, but there was one particularly gruesome difference between the bodies. Chris Byers was castrated. His scrotum was gone and his penis was skinned. Nearly all reporting on this case claims the boys were hogtied, but this is inaccurate. The hands of each boy were tied behind him, the right wrist bound to the right ankles and the left wrist bound to the left ankles. The wrist and ankles were separated by about six inches of bindings. According to Bob Ruff, in hog tying, a third binding is required that ties the two sides together, preventing the animal from using his legs. Without the extra tie, the boys, if conscious, could have easily worked their way out of the bindings. Many versions of this story state that the boys were bound with their own shoelaces. This is almost accurate. All, on all but one victim, the killer or killers used the boys' shoelaces to bind them. At trial, Peretti testified that Michael Moore was bound with one black shoelace and one length of black string. Another myth circulated about the bindings is that they were all tied with three different types of knots. According to Bob Ruff, there were only two types, with only once, only used once. The killer tied a square knot on one of Michael's bindings, and the rest were tied with a series of double and triple half-hitch knots, the kind of simple knots you use to tie your shoes. The boys' bicycles were not in the creek near the bodies. A John boat dragging the water at the pipe bridge recovered them at the bridge's halfway point. The location was 60 feet from a house on the end of Macaulay Street and the Mayfair Apartments. Police recovered nearly all the boys' clothing at the scene, but for five except for five socks and two pair of underwear. Officers found two clear footprints in the mud on the bank near Michael Moore's body. The bank appeared as though someone had tried to wipe or wash it down, removing any traces of the shoe prints. On the other bank was a steep path with something where something slid down the hill. The weeds and grasses were bent and the dirt was scuffed up. At the bottom are two more footprints from a left and a right tennis shoe. The tennis shoe prints were approximately 11 inches in length, with a clear imprint on the of the tread. Police made cast of the prints. These prints have, were never compared to anyone but the officers at the scene and the three main suspects in the case. The murders were under the jurisdiction of the West Memphis Police and Chief Inspector Gary Gitchell headed the investigation. Medical examiner Frank Peretti performed the initial autopsy on the three boys. Peretti was the assist assistant ME and having failed his exam more than once, was not certified by the Board of Medical Examiners at the time. 
15 years later, renowned pathologist Dr. Werner Spitz performed three new autopsies. Dr. Dr. Vincent Mayo, or Mayo, also re reviewed photos of the bodies and the original autopsy reports. Both experts concluded that Peretti missed the mark, especially when it came to the injuries inflicted on the boys. We'll discuss these findings in greater detail, but for now, let's focus on Peretti's initial reports. Michael Moore had bruising on his left cheek, cuts on his right front scalp, and a large cut on his forehead. On the left side of his scalp was a dovetail cut with an upside down, upside down L-shaped bruise. Michael's skull was fractured in the front, right side of his head, and his brain indicated hemorrhage. Dr. Peretti noted that Michael's anus was dilated. Anal dilation is quite common in dead bodies, especially when submerged underwater. Peretti saw no injuries to Michael's genital area uh, and no blood or seminal fluid, fluid was present. Dr. Peretti concluded that Michael showed no physical indications that he was sexually assaulted. Peretti also concluded that Michael Moore died from multiple injuries and drowning. Peretti also recovered a hair from Michael's left binding. The hair is vital as to later to discoveries that we will discuss soon. Christopher Byers had bruising, cuts, scratches, and abrasion on his face and lips. Like Michael and Stevie, Chris had multiple skull fractures and brain hemorrhage on the left side of his head. His anal cavity was dilated, but again, there were no injuries to his anus, nor was there any blood or semen. Chris's scrotal sac and testes were gone. The skin from his penis was also gone, but the shaft remained intact. Peretti found a small mixture of blood and fluid in Chris's lungs, and Peretti reported that Chris died from multiple injuries. The castration of Christopher Byers leads many to assume that he suffered the worst and greatest number of injuries. Stevie Branch, however, endured many more than Michael or Chris. The left side of Stevie's face was riddled with cuts, abrasions, and gouges. The right side was stained with blood, even after sitting in the water. There were bruises on the right side of his face and a bell-shaped scratch on the left side of his jaw. An edema was present on the back of his scalp, and he also had multiple skull fractures on both the left and right side of his head with brain hemorrhage. Under the anal dilation, Dr. Peretti again found no signs Stevie was sodomized. As with the other two, there was no blood, no semen, and no evidence of injury to the anal cavity. Stevie's penis, however, was a reddish-purple color, and it had a few minor abrasions on it. The autopsy reports tell us two things. First, other than the castration of Stevie, Chris Byers, none of the boys showed any of the usual indicated indications of sexual assault. Second, with drowning listed as a partial cause of death for two of the boys, we know that Stevie and Michael were still alive when they went into the water. According to Mara Leverett, an investigative reporter who, just, who covered the crime and authored the book Devil's Knot, police had three theories within hours of finding the bodies. The first was that the killer knew the boys. The second was that a stranger committed the murders. And the third theory was that the second graders were killed by a satanic cult. Gitchell struggled to get the autopsy reports from the medical examiner's office. He wrote letter after letter demanding the reports. Without them, police had no information about causes of death, a murder weapon, or what caused the castration of Christopher Byers. With the investigation stalled for nearly a month, rumors of occult activity quickly consumed the investigation. Early on, Gitchell stated publicly that they were looking into the cult theory. With virtually no investigation into the family members or any other suspects, police fueled by public panic focused almost solely on connecting the deaths to satanic activity. Jerry Driver was Crittenden County's chief juvenile probation officer, but he was not a cop. His assistant, Steve Jones, found the first floating shoe in the creek. Driver fancied himself quite the expert on Satanism. He bought books on the occult and taught seminars on identifying Satanic activity. For years, Driver was obsessed with the notion that a Satanic cult was afoot in West Memphis. Driver supervised a young man named Damien Eccles. Driver was Damien's probation officer for about a year before the murders. After the boys were found, it took no time for Driver to point his finger at the troubled teenager. Born Michael Wayne Hutchison, Damien was 18 and about to be a father. His girlfriend, Dominique Tier, was pregnant with his child, and the couple planned to raise the baby together. Damien lived with his mother at the Broadway trailer park in the Lakeshore neighborhood of Marion, just north of Memphis. 
Lakeshore was one of the poorest, most dilapidated neighborhoods in the area. Damien had a long history of psychological problems. He was hospitalized on several occasions and also diagnosed with severe depression and schizophrenia. Like thousands of kids since the late 70s, Damien wrote dark poetry, dressed almost exclusively in black, had long black hair, and was a self-professed practitioner of the Wiccan religion. In West Memphis, a boy like Damien stuck out like a sore thumb, drawing the worst kind of attention from the homogenous West Memphis community. Driver's first contact with Damien concerned a domestic incident with one of Damien's previous girlfriends. The mother of 15-year-old Deanna Jane Holcomb called police to report that Damien had been harassing Deanna after a breakup. The mother reported that Damien threatened Deanna's life and the life of one of her male friends. She also reported that Damien was trying to get Deanna into black magic. After a one runaway attempt a few days later, police found books in Damien's room containing dark poetry and occult iconography. Police seized the writings and drawings and added them to Damien's juvenile record. Driver kept a watchful eye on Damien even after he turned 18. Driver dogged Damien Eccles like a redneck Van Helsing, obsessed with the idea that his former charge was a card-carrying member of a satanic cult that plagued West Memphis. Damien has always been open and honest about his religious preferences. During trial, Damien was forthright about his involvement in the Wiccan religion, and he made every effort to distinguish Wicca from Satanism. To Driver, it was a distinction without a difference. The boy was an instrument of the devil. Driver also had a personal bent against a boy named Jason Baldwin. 16-year-old Jason lived with his mother in the Lakeshore Estates trailer park. Jason attended Marion High School, where he was an exceptional student, an artist who planned to study graphic art when he graduated. Jason's best friend was Damian Eccles, and like Damian, Jason stood out among the conservative citizenry of West Memphis. He was not into Damian's Wiccan beliefs, but he was a nonconformist. His art was masterful but dark. He loved heavy metal and wore graphic t-shirts with one of his favorite bands, being uh, Metallica. On May 7th, Steve Jones interviewed Damien Eccles for the first time about the murders. Lieutenant James Sudbury questioned him three separate times between May 7th and May 10th. Damien told Lieutenant Sudbury that he did not know the three dead boys. When probed as to what kind of person would commit such crimes, he replied that it was a sick individual who probably enjoyed killing. Damien gave police an alibi for the afternoon and evening of May 5th. He told police that he and Damini went to Jason Baldwin's uncle's house in the afternoon. Damien's father picked them up at six and then took them home, where he spent the evening talking on the phone with two girls he knew in Memphis, Tennessee. Many of you may be familiar with the major witnesses against the West Memphis Three. We're going to address all of those witnesses in detail, but want to wait until Bob is with us to share his knowledge of the case. For now, we will briefly highlight some of the major players. Police barely questioned the family members. Terry Hobbs was not interviewed until 14 years after the murders. His whereabouts on the afternoon in question are still unknown. Investors, investigators briefly looked at Mark Byers as a suspect as well. When questioned about his interactions with Chris on May 5th, Mark admitted to, quote, giving Chris a few licks with his belt before telling him to clean the carport. Todd Moore was not in the area when the boys were killed. Todd drove a truck for a living and he was on the road. He returned to West Memphis on May 6th. Police may not have questioned the victim's family, but they did take hair samples from relatives and blood and urine samples from Todd Moore and Mark Byers. No DNA was taken from Terry Hobbs until over a decade later. One of the star witnesses in the case was a woman named Victoria Hutchison. On May 7th, the day after police pulled the tiny bodies from the water, police questioned Vicki about her involvement in a credit card scam. Vicki's son Aaron was with her. Aaron, a classmate and friend of the victims, told police that he saw Michael on, after school on the day of the murders talking to an African-American man with yellow teeth. The man was in a maroon car and was wearing a t-shirt with writing on it. Aaron said he heard the man tell Michael that his mother asked him to pick him up from school. According to Aaron, Michael got into the car and left with the stranger. On May 27th, police interviewed Aaron again. This time, the, bull to the boy told a shocking story that he, Michael, and Chris often went into the Robin Hood woods 
where they watched five men doing what men and women do. On June 9th, Aaron's story grew wilder. Aaron told police that he witnessed the murders. He said that he was with the boys on the afternoon of May 5th, and they went into the woods to watch the men have sex in the woods. The men's faces were painted black, and one had long black hair. The men had large knives with blood on them. Aaron reported that the men abused a dog and then killed a cat, cooked it, and ate it. He said that a boy named Jesse Miss Kelly tied him up, but he was able to get away. He described watching as Jesse, Damien, and Jason took the boys' clothes off, tied them with rope, then stabbed and raped them. Vicki Hutchinson spoke with police and offered to play detective. She lived close to Jesse Miss Kelly Jr., who helped them babysat her children. Vicki and Jesse were close, she claimed, and she believed that he would have information about Damien Eccles and the murders. Jesse Lloyd Miss Kelly Jr. was 17 and a high school dropout. He lived with his father in Highland Trailer Park in Mor Marion. Jesse loved kids and babysat for many parents in the neighborhood. Generally a sweet kid, Jesse also liked to fight. Barely over five foot tall, Jesse loved to play tough, picking fights with other guys. Friends and family members described Jesse as slow. Jesse underwent an examination to, determination, to, determine, to determine his fitness to stand trial. Dr. William Wilkins determined that Jesse had an IQ of 72, placing him in the middle of the congenitally impaired category. Dog, Dr. Wilkins found that Jesse performed at a second to fourth grade level and that his perception of reality was childlike. Vicky told police that Jesse confided in her that his friend Damien Eccles practiced occultism and drank blood. Vicky convinced Jesse to introduce her to Damien. According to Vicky, she attended a witch's gathering called an Ebat, a Sabbat, and with Damien and Jesse on May 19th. Vicky described the event to police in detail. She claimed that Damien picked them up in a red Ford Escort and drove them to the gathering in nearby Troll, Arkansas. The group consisted of 12 to 15 teenagers with their faces painted black. When she saw the kids taking off their clothes, Vicky asked Damien to take her home. Police polygraphed Vicky and reported that she, quote, passed Vicky, but Vicky's story was questionable, however. For example, Damien Eccles did not have a driver's license and was never known to drive and didn't own a car. At 11 o'clock a.m. on June 3, 1993, Jesse Miss Kelly voluntarily went to the police station for questioning. Although he was a minor, he faced his interrogators alone. His father consented to the interview by phone, but he didn't go with him to the station. Moreover, Jesse had no attorney to represent him. When he arrived, Jesse signed a waiver of his Miranda rights, after which officers fingerprinted and took biological samples from him. Police polygraphed Jesse before interrogating him. In addition to several control questions, the examiner, Bill Durham, asked Jesse five questions. If he had ever been in Robin Hood Hills, if he ever took part in devil worship, if he ever attended a devil worship ceremony in the Turner Twist area, if he was involved in the murders, and if he knew who killed the three boys. Jesse answered no to all five questions. When Durham completed the polygraph exam, he emerged from the room and said Jesse was lying his ass off. Polygraph expert and witness for the defense, Warren Holmes, reviewed the result and testified at Jesse's trial that there were no indicators of deception in Jesse's responses to the five questions, and that the structure of the exam itself was deeply flawed. At some point, Chief Inspector Gitchell and Inspector Ridge began the interrogation. We do not know what time the questioning began because it was not recorded. We do know that Jesse was at the station for four and a half hours before officers began recording the interview. At 2.44 p.m., Gitchell and Ridge turned on the tape recorder. What followed was what many experts have called a textbook false confession. Dr. Richard Offshe, a Pulitzer Prize winning expert on false and coerced confessions, testified to that effect at Jesse's trial. Many law enforcement professionals since including former FBI agent and counterterrorism counter expert Tim Clementi, wholeheartedly occur, concur with Offshe's analysis. There are many aspects of Jesse's so-called confession that deserve closer scrutiny by law enforcement. First, most of the information about the case came from Gitchell and Ridge. As they fed him the facts, Jesse repeated their statements back almost verbatim. 
Second, when he did volunteer original information about the murders, Jesse's version of what happened did not match the facts of the case. First, Jesse claimed that the attacks happened in the morning around 9 a.m. Later, he said it happened around noon. We know that the boys were in school that day and they were seen alive in the evening of May 5th by neighbors and parents. It is almost certain that Stevie, Michael, and Chris were murdered after 7 o'clock p.m. Jesse also told the investigators that the boys were tied with rope, not shoelaces. Additionally, Jesse told police that Damien and Jason sodomized the boys. We know that the medical examiner found no evidence of sexual assault to any of the boys' anal cavities. Jesse reported that Michael Moore started to run and he grabbed the boy and he held him for Damien and Jason. Jesse also claimed that Chris Byers was strangled, first by hands, then with a stick placed on his throat. The autopsy reports on all three boys state that the medical examiner found no significant injuries to the boys' necks and their hyoid bones were intact. Jesse told police quite a story about his involvement with Damien, Jason, and occult activities. He said that he was involved in Damien's alleged cult for about three months. In that time, he attended meetings where they would kill dogs, cook them over an open fire, and eat the meat from their legs. The interview concluded at 3.18 p.m. Immediately after, Gitchell and Ridge went to the prosecutor with the confession, seeking arrest warrants for Jesse, Damien, and Jason. The prosecutor saw the many issues with the confession and denied their request. Gitchell and Ridge went back to Jesse for another interview. After several hours, the tape recorder was turned on, and suddenly, Jesse had the timeline straight. He claimed that he, Jamian, and Jason arrived at the woods around 6 o'clock p.m. And now that Jesse's statement was in line with the facts, Gitchell and Ridge got their arrest warrants. Shortly after the second interview, police arrested Damian Eccles, Jason Baldwin, and J Jesse Miss Kelly for the murders of Stevie Branch, Chris Byers, and Michael Moore. The state of Arkansas tried J Jesse Miss Kelly first, represented by district attorneys John Fogelman and Brett Davis. In exchange for his testimony against his co-defendants, the government took the death penalty off the table. Despite ample evidence from his attorneys discrediting Jesse's confession, the jury convicted Jesse on one count of first-degree murder and two counts of second-degree murder. Judge Burnett sentenced him to life plus 40 years. The joint trials of Jason Baldwin and Damian Eccles began a month later, in February 1994. The state put on all the evidence we discussed previously. They also called jailhouse informant Michael Carson to the stand. Carson, a juvenile, faced prison time on several counts of burglary. He spent time with Jason Baldwin while incarcerated and with him before Jason's trial. Carson testified that Jason admitted that he, Damian, and Jesse killed the boys back in August of 93. He said Jason told him he sucked the blood from Chris Byer's penis and put his testicles in his mouth. The prosecution also introduced evidence that five months after police arrested Damian, Jesse, Jesse and Jason, Drivers found a large, serrated Special Forces survival knife at the bottom of the lake behind Jason's home at the Lakeshore Trailer Park. District Attorney Fogelman argued that the knife was the weapon used in the murders. Dr. Peretti testified that the wounds on the boys were consistent with the knife. In contrast, he also testified on cross-examination. The castration and skinning was done with such precision that it had to be done with something very sharp, a very precise instrument. The defense was able to get Peretti to admit that this would be a nearly impossible task in such a dark, wet, mosquito-thick environment. Two teenage girls testified that they overheard Damien saying he killed the three boys. The second girl testified that she heard Damien say he killed the boys and was going to kill two more before turning himself in. The jury heard the evidence, deliberated, and returned guilty verdicts for both defendants. Jason Baldwin was sentenced to life, and Damian Eccles received the death penalty. The West Memphis Three remained in prison for 18 years before their release in 2011. The convictions of the West Memphis Three sparked a massive movement to secure their freedom. Joe Berlinger's 1996 documentary Paradise Lost, The Child Murders at Robin Hood Hills, brought nationwide attention to the case. Celebrities like Henry Rollins, Eddie Vedder, and Johnny Depp rallied to the cause, promoting the Free the West Memphis Three campaign and raising money for Jason, Jesse, and Damien. 
The film expanded into a trilogy that followed the case throughout the appellate process. Investigative reporter Mara Leverett's book, Devil's Knot, and Peter Jackson's 2012 documentary, West of Memphis, presented more revelations about the evidence in the, against the West Memphis Three. Michael Carson admitted to lying on the stand. In West of Memphis, Carson apologized on camera to Jason Baldwin for giving false testimony. He said that the drugs he was using at the time, like LSD, made reality seem like a dream and that his testimony was a product of his drug-addled mind and a desire to stay out of the penitentiary. In 2003, Vicki Hutchinson also admitted that her story about Damien and the Espot was entirely fabricated, as was the story told by her son Aaron. There have also been forensic discoveries since the trials. First, testing performed in 2007 showed that none of the DNA retrieved from the crime scene matched Damien, Jesse, or Aaron. Or I'm sorry, Damien, Jesse, Damien, Jesse, or Jason. DNA recovered from the hair found in one of Michael Moore's bindings was, however, consistent with Terry Hobbs. Police recovered an additional hair on a tree stump near the crime scene. Testing in 2007 revealed that the DNA was consistent with that of David Jacoby, one of Terry Hobbs' friends. Police interviewed Hobbs after the DNA results came back. He was evasive and denied any involvement in the murders. When presented with his history of domestic violence, he denied that as well. In 2002, Pam Hobbs sent a package to the defense team. In it were 14 or 15 knives that once belonged to Terry Hobbs. Among the knives was a pocket knife that her father gave to Stevie. Pam told attorneys that Stevie never went anywhere without that knife, and he most likely had it with him on May 5th. She advised that she did not turn the knives over to the prosecution earlier because she didn't trust them. Dr. Vincent DeMeo examined photos of the evidence and concluded that the cuts and wounds on the boys' faces, as well as the alleged castration of Chris Byers, were done by animals, not humans, namely snapping turtles. The makers of West Memphis tested the snapping turtle theory. They placed a pig carcass in water with snapping turtles, and the turtles left bite and claw marks identical to the cuts and scratches on the boys. In light of the newly acquired information, the defendants, now appellants, petitioned the trial court to reopen the case. Their petition was denied. In 2010, the Arkansas Supreme Court overruled that decision, remanding the case for rehearing on the facts. After much negotiation, the prosecution and defense reached a plea agreement. In 2011, Damien, Jesse, and Jason entered Alford pleas in exchange for their release from prison. We'll discuss the Alford plea in a little while. The West Memphis Three are all still fighting for exoneration through DNA testing. In April of this year, the Arkansas Supreme Court ruled in favor of Damien Eccles in his appeal to a lower court's 2002 decision to deny MBAC testing of evidence in the case. The lower court judge ruled that because they are not incarcerated, they no longer have the right to testing. There's a great deal more to this case, and we'll do our best to address some of the details during the discussion and in the scrum. But now, however, it's time to bring up the doc for his analysis on the murders in Robin Hood Hills. Hey, everyone. So this is normally where I come in with my background in looking at uh, criminal psychology and uh, give my two cents. This is an interesting one. I think that because of documentaries, people are being kind of led to think it's more complicated than what I see it as being. Occam's razor, you want to always look at for the most likely scenario, the thing with the, the least amount to explain. So let's start with where are the bikes? The the bikes that the, the boys are seen on, they're definitely... Uh, a big part of this crime they're up on the pipe bridge the boys are found down in this creek whatever you want to call it so the the most logical thing is the boys either see something down there which gets their attention something that brings them down where they say let's leave the bike there let's leave the bike there go down and check out what's going on down here or uh they just go down there for some other reason and somebody sees them doing something down there and decides to react to it. So I think that the offender or offenders, because it's very likely that there's two people here, it's a lot to control 
um, all these three kids. So it's it's arguably more likely that there's multiple offenders. They're either down there and the boys see them doing something, and this could be drugs, it could be sexual acts, use your imagination, not Satanism, by the way. And they go down there and interfere, and that triggers this whole scenario. Or the boys are down there themselves doing something which uh, draws attention. This could be something quote unquote naughty, something that uh, an authority figure reacts to, or it could be that there's just somebody sees them down there and decides to take an opportunity. But I believe this whole crime transpires there and it's, it's largely reactive or opportunistic. So the boys are, are then in one scenario, this is a sex crime. Uh, which, that's the scenario I think it is. Now that doesn't mean that there's penetration. It means that there's a, a sexual motive, even if, if secondary it's been described as like a type of, of punishment by the profiler, John Douglas. And I agree. I think though, that we don't want to get too much into, into looking at the strict categories. That's uh, that's not really understanding the complexity of human motivation. It can be that it's punishment and there's a sexual element to the punishment. Think of something like BDSM. Uh, there's this idea of, of dominance in that uh, it's sexual. There's uh, it control punish me, that, that kind of thing. And so I'm not saying it's, it's formally BDSM, but the point I'm getting at is there can be uh, both of those things at play. So in scenario one, um, the boys come across someone who has a sexual interest in children and seems to be angry at them for some reason. It doesn't mean it's a primary sexual interest in children, but there is some sexual interest in children, particularly young boys. And then he gains control out of, over them once again could be another perpetrator i don't think there was a gun involved that's always it's always a possibility it's an easy way to get control over someone you point a gun at them and say i'll kill you but i doubt it i think that probably them just being in an area where they didn't really have anywhere to run couldn't get away from one or more grown men and probably having a very intimidating presence so i can imagine it going one way where it's like take off your clothes i want to see your muscles something like that and um, there's some resistance by the boys. Maybe they try to flee and they're, they're overcome and then they're tied up to control them because it's, it's not like a sexual type of binding. It doesn't show a fantasy in the bindings. But um, so, so it could be functional or it could be that it's part of, of the fantasy. I think it's, it's functional. I think it's part of the discipline um, element. I, I don't think it's a really big part of the, um, sorry, part of the control element. I don't think it's a big part of the fantasy. But I, I think there's definitely a pedophilic part. And the reason, and that goes into rage too. So you might have a conflicted offender, somebody who's projecting onto the, uh, onto the boys. Maybe he's seeing them as, as being gay, something like that. And it's, it's really him. And he's doing that too. Um, he's, he's making it about them to take away the responsibilities and facing his own desires. That's why we might see no penetration too. Reminds me of the uh, Atlanta child murders case a little bit. And so at this point, the, uh, the boys are, are beaten, um, maybe even whipped or something like that. This person goes too far, realizes there's no coming back from that. So now you've got to kill them and you got to get rid of the bodies to put some distance between you and, and the crime. And so you put them into the, the water and you, he's using all improvised things. Once again, he's using the boys own shoelaces and he's using sticks to, to pin down items of clothing, just more evidence that this didn't involve any other scene and it didn't take any preparation. I think the other possible scenario is that the boys were, were killed while clothed. And of course they'd have to be bound after. So then the, the binding becomes maybe more about keeping them weighted down. Some people have said it could be about carrying them, but I don't, I don't see that It'd have to be very strong shoelaces. And frankly, the, these are little boys. They're not hard to move into the water there. So I actually like the, the previous scenario. I have taken up a lot of time here. I, I have some ideas about the type of offender that might want to do it, but that's really my initial take out of the gate. We've got all evening to talk about this. So let's bring up um, Alex and Morph and Cloyd and Susanna to, to talk about this here. Hey, hey guys. guys. Hi guys. Good to see you. So who wants to go first? Well, let's let's go with probably one of the, the the parts that I think is contested. That's it's silly that it's contested, 
we're it's all in this area, right? It's all in this wilderness area. There's no because a lot of people think that this happened in a house and then was moved. Yeah. I don't think so. I think that yeah, that's I not the simplest explanation. The boys are seen going down there. Their bikes are found on the pipe bridge. Can we at least yeah. can we agree on that? Yeah. Yes, I would agree with that. Yeah, because the bikes are there. I think, you know, that really who's going to drag back several two bicycles, you know, to put in the water, you know, and, and that's it, that's my understanding, right? The bikes were were well, in the water, not just the Well, no, I'm seeing that the right? bikes were in the water. OK, yeah, the bikes yeah. were submerged at the pipe bridge at that and halfway they, point. And yeah. they brought them out. OK, so they went down on the bikes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then obviously we're, you know, is that I would assume that's an attempt to conceal, right? You're concealing the bikes, concealing where the boys were. So it it's going to take longer to find the boys themselves than if you can't find their mm -hmm. bicycles. I think even if you're a stranger, you have a motive to conceal them and it doesn't really take that sure. much time. I mean, you're right by the water there. Why wouldn't you take the extra few minutes to just put them in? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And obviously that's, that is what occurred. So, yeah. Um, and, you know, I mean, that seems to me to be why the, the boys were put in the water and, and tied the way they were to, to, it doesn't seem like this is restraining them from running away. It's more kind of making them, you know, smaller, if that, if anything, to, to wait. I don't know if they were weighted down or how they were held down, but it seems like that's the purpose of, of that potentially. I, I've wondered um, if they were weighted down somehow and then the movement through the water or even just the current itself dislodged whatever was weighting them down. Potentially. I mean, the clothes, we know the clothes were not necessarily mm -hmm. weighted, but with the sticks, the sticks being used right. to prevent the clothing from being discovered, you know, so they don't leave, this person didn't leave the clothes strewn about the, the banks of this little creek. Mm -hmm. They were submerged and held down so i mean right. obviously that was the intent is keep this you know this is not a crime where they're displaying the bodies where they want no. this person to be found this is hide it for as long as possible i mean that's you know my take as a dna expert maybe <laughs> cloy should be speaking to this more <laughs> but yeah uh, yeah well here, i have i have a lot of course, I think about this case. First of all, the first thing is these three boys did not kill these kids. They're absolutely the wrong right. people. Yeah. Second We're not going to argue I, that, right? And it's not satanic. We, we can just move no. past that. Yeah. What I, oh, my God. <laughs> I can't tell you how many cases I handled over the years where they said it was a satanic cult. And there's a there's a legal term that comes to mind when you're talking about that. It's bullshit. He's <laughs> not, <laughs> <laughs> not a satanic. Because, you know, like you said, Lee, uh, Occam's razor, keep it simple. You know, there's so many things. These kids were killed by somebody. Uh, the most important thing you have to remember is you cannot make a judgment on who the killer is at the beginning and, and, and try to make all your evidence fit that scenario. You have to go where the, uh, where the evidence takes you. This case was screwed up from the beginning. From the beginning, okay, you got you got uh, these kids found in the river or creek or whatever it is, and it's a muddy area. And a restaurant just down the stream or upstream, whatever it was, there's a guy in the bathroom. He's got blood on him and and mud, and and the officer didn't go in. I mean, maybe the kids weren't found by them, but still, you don't go in. That's a screw up. I mean, you, go where the evidence takes you. What are the odds that some guy would be in that bathroom? Covered in mud or had mud under his shoes and blood on him. That's unrelated to this case. It's it's astronomical. Let me just hold and, on. Yeah. That was a patrolman, right? That at the time that, that, that's their job too. That's no, I know that. Too. That's yeah. also a screw up. But um, just to be clear, uh, it was like retroactively. Oh yeah, there was a guy with blood in there, but the cop that came to look into that was a patrolman not responding to this case. Is that right, Alex? Right. She had actually already responded to, I think it was Stevie Branch's house. So she was aware that there were boys missing, or at least that Stevie was missing. Then she goes to Bojangles, drives around, doesn't take a report, doesn't go in, and then goes to, I think it was Michael Moore, to that call of him being yeah. missing. 
but it was important enough for her to drive up in the drive-thru, right? Drive up <laughs> in the drive-thru. Why, why do you the go worst there? Part. And there's I'm blood, and then you don't around, walk into the it. bathroom and look. Yeah. <laughs> what do you do? Right. I mean, Right. Weird. And right. for me, the worst part, like when I heard that, the first thing I said was, okay, great. Where, where's the evidence? There, where's the evidence? Yeah. yeah. Where's the blood? Now it's gone. Now it's well, gone. The thing is, if it they was... had done that and they had collected that blood, you would know absolutely for sure if that's related or not. Exactly. But you cannot just exactly. ignore that. You can't ignore that there was a guy in a bathroom not far away who had mud like he would if he was down by the water and blood. And just ignore that. Yeah, it's ridiculous. And, and like I said, you cannot decide at the beginning who the suspects are at any point in this investigation, and then just follow the evidence that points to your guy, but not to somebody else. Because that's if that's what I call bad detective work. You go where the evidence takes you. I mean, I've known people that do that. You decide what the answer is, then only look for the evidence that matches your your uh, estimation. That's really bad police work. And I think that this has been somewhat done with the the TV viewing public too. This oh, idea that, that there's another crime scene because that would be what it, in some interpretations is needed for it to be one of the fathers, which it may be, by the way, we're, we're going to get to a lot. So let's, yeah, let's start it talk. again. Well, first right? of all, okay. like but, why? Yeah. Why, do you, why do you take them away and then bring them back? What's the point? There is or no the... Point. The idea is that they came back and then this transpired somewhere else and then you take them back. I just say, what, like, once again, if you're trying to, if you have a specific scenario that you're trying to prove to make it this guy, but to me, that the obvious thing is this all happened down there. Well, it did happen. Yeah, that, 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 again, bullshit. People don't bring people back to the scene or whatever. It's too much effort, too much chance of being caught. You know, you don't do that. Mm. That's not the way these things happen. Keep it simple, stupid. It happened there. They were found there. Sure, he, he uh, put them in the water with the bikes on the top of the hill, and he may have taken them down and dumped them. Yeah, sure, he might have, because he didn't want people to see the bikes up there and dump them in the water, too. But he certainly right. did not kill them away, or whoever it is, kill them away from the scene and then bring them back. That's ridiculous. Taking down three boys and their bikes, uh, it's, it's not going to be easy to get down there. It's not like it's paved, no. right? And you don't people you don't know who's coming and going. I just I too oh. I think it's too much of a risk. It is. You're right. Exactly. And people I, that when this first of all they're lazy, and they want to get out of there quick. That's the way these guys think. Well, I think uh, Bob wants to come on because he's going to clear up some things and shed a little bit more light on the situation. So I think it's a good time we bring him in. What's up, everybody? Hey, hey Bob. Bob. <laughs> Welcome to the show. Hello. Thank you for doing this. All right. What did I get wrong? Uh, not, not much. There's just a lot of, because I know like the work that Chloe's doing and the work that doc's doing, um, is so dependent on details of the scene. Mm -hmm. So I was, and, and, and no offense to you guys, it took me two years of investigating this case to get to a lot of these details. So it's, it's really hard to, to sum all that stuff up. Um, but I just, I just mentioned in the chat. I'm like, some of the stuff you guys are basing on is, is, is not exactly correct. One thing, first of all, Chloe, hundred percent. Uh, agree with you 100%. Like, and Doc, too, like these bodies weren't moved from somewhere else. The first Thank thing you. that I think everybody needs to really understand is this location. It is not what people think. I, I, uh, the movie The Devil's Not did a did a, a pretty terrible injustice. The book's great. Mara Leverett's great. And, mm -hmm. and the book was, and the movie was great. But the book, the movie shows the kids riding into this forest, right, at the beginning. And they're going way back in the woods and they get to this pipe bridge. That is not the case at all. That is not what this was. The place they were killed was a, a tiny patch of woods about the size of a football field. It was surrounded by people. So on one side of it, on the west side of it, you go up the hill, there's an operating truck wash right there, a semi-truck wash. It was in operation. People were there the entire time. Where the where the bayou was, which is on the south border of this, this football field patch of woods, uh, where the pipe bridge was, from that pipe bridge, there's you're staring into the backyard or the back the back of a house to the southeast, into the into the southwest is an apartment build a two story apartment building. All of those the the house and the apartments all had a direct view right down to that that bayou and where the pipe bridge was, uh, and, and this was still daylight time. So if we're, we're, when we're talking about like. Um, as you guys said, and you're absolutely correct, like the idea of them being killed somewhere else and then moved there, 
is ludicrous. I mean, it would be literally carrying them in front of a bunch of people. The, the place they were killed, they were found, uh, David Jacoby, uh, who was a friend of Terry Hobbs, who was helping with the search that night, he had located a set of bike tracks in the area that's called Robin Hood Hills, which is on the south side of the bayou, not the south the side they were found on, the other side where the neighborhood is. And he found these bike tracks, a group of teenagers that were friends with uh, Chris Byer's brother, Ryan, all went with him and they followed these bike tracks through this whole path. And then the bike tracks just stopped at this pipe bridge, but there was no bikes there. And that's when David told me in an interview uh, that he looked at the pipe bridge. It was getting dark at that point, And he saw a single set of muddy footprints on the pipe bridge coming back. Uh, so and I think that's critical information for both Doc uh, and, uh, and uh, I, I only look at myself on the screen. I can't see the name. Cloyd. Sorry, Cloyd? Cloyd. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's a critical piece of information to know uh, that that they were, there was a single set of muddy footprints coming back. That's your offender coming back into the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. sure. it, it has mm -hmm. me. There's three boys go over with dry shoes because they were in a dry, sandy area on the bikes. And then the offender comes back with mud on his feet. But we have to understand how this was, when this, where these murders were taking place, you go over the pipe bridge into this tiny football field patch of woods. There's a little tributary that goes out into the main bayou. That's where they were found. And they were surrounded by people. So uh, as you as you mentioned, Cloyd, like spending time with the bodies, moving bodies, bullshit's the exact right word. There, No one's going to do that. Whoever did this was going to be in a panic. They didn't mm. know if anybody saw them cross that pipe bridge, but certainly anyone could have because there's all these houses and this house and the apartments that are staring right at it. They went, they said the boys go there, they follow up there, and now they're coming back out of there. That had to be happened very quickly. Uh, there was a question about, I just took some notes as you guys were talking. Um, there's a question about the, the bindings. The bindings were applied post-mortem, and they were not for any utility. The way they were bound was right wrist to right ankle, left wrist to left ankle, with pretty big stretches of string, of shoestring. So like that in 16, 18 inches, up to two feet of shoestring, they were never measured, so we don't know the exact uh, distance of them. But if you think right to right, left to left, that doesn't stop you from running. It doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't do anything because you can just have your hands in front of you and still run like that. Uh, and 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 because of the markings that we see on the the wrists and ankles, uh, we know from the medical examiners they were they were applied post mortem. The way they were kept down, the utility in those, in my opinion, is they were after the murders. The boys they needed to hide the bodies. Which, uh, and I'll see, Doc, if you, if, if you and Chloe uh, agree with this, but the reason to do that, not to just get out of there, but to, to make it so that the bodies are never found, so that no one knows that the murders occurred, to me indicates that this is someone with a known personal relationship to these boys. Someone who thinks, maybe someone who thinks maybe they were seen coming over that bridge, those boys' bodies can't be found later because their people are going to know they're the ones that are with them. Uh, they were they were stripped naked. Those bindings were tied and then wrapped in sticks and pinned to the bottom of the the mud in the bottom of that creek. That was the utility in the in the strings was to keep the bodies down under the water. The same thing was done as Susanna mentioned with the clothing. They were the the clothing was pinned down, uh, stuffed down into the mud with those with those sticks. So that was the the kind of utility of those things. So I, I think it's, it's for your guys' analysis, and criti it's critical for you to understand kind of the, the area that we're talking about, the amount of eyes that were on that area, the fact that it's daylight, the muddy footprint, the reason that the bindings were applied post-mortem. And then um, you guys mentioned the man at the, we call him the Bojangles man, the mysterious guy at the gas station. Um, uh, Alex, you had mentioned that, that the officer's name was Regina Meeks, uh, Regina Meek, that was the patrol officer. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I want to make clear to correct is you mentioned that you thought she had already been uh, to deal with the to Stevie Branch's house. No one ever went to Stevie Branch's house in this investigation. No. Yeah, it okay. was it, it was Chris by it was um, John Byers had called and reported the kids missing. Now, I agree, Cloyd, like That's for right. us, it's particularly in hindsight, it's like, what the hell are you doing? You you have you have this this crime and you got this bloody guy. At a at a at a at a restaurant, this go in, check it, investigate it, get the evidence. 
the reality of it is all they knew is the boys were out on bicycles and they didn't know where they were at. Where this Bojangles is, yeah, if you draw a line to it, it's about a, a mile away. But if you're physically in West Memphis and you drive from the from the area of the crime scene to where that restaurant is, it you you feel like you're in a different county. Like I I I, I have lots of problems with this investigation. At the same time, I, I I do give her a bit of a pass on that because all they knew is they had kids on bikes way over on this side of town that no one knows where they're at. And then she gets this report of, of what seemed like a drunk and intoxicated guy stumbling into a bathroom on this side of town. And I think the right. reason it got blown off was because she was trying to get back to the other side of town to help mm-hmm. look for the boys uh, is why I think that it kind of got blown off. Still, and she obviously, mentioned that in her testimony as well. That it was yeah. in a different county, that it wasn't her ward or something like that. Yeah, and I and, and that may be list. that may be the be the case. I don't, but I'm just practically speaking, if you go there and drive there, we actually when we shot the documentary, we had we got a Navy SEAL uh, to try to make that trek from the crime scene to the Bojangles, and he was able to do it. But he's a Navy SEAL. Uh, the reality is the idea of somebody taking that route from the Bayou to get to there. Is unlikely. We also know from the medical examiners that the boys weren't bloody. So the idea that this guy's got blood on him is kind of irrelevant, unless he just cut himself, you know, in the process of getting away. Personally, I don't think that that is relevant to the crime scene based on the based on the timeline. Well, we know for sure after Atkins discovered the bodies, boys, and taking evidence out of that scene, it wasn't late. The thing about it is with a Navy SEAL going, that's if you know a precise time. They didn't have precise time. The boys were missing. There was some time looking for them, and then that happened. I mean, they could guess they can't be precise. I'm saying he was the guy, but that's not something you can just dish. The other thing yeah. is not they're not guess because they were submerged in water. Did they have wounds in blood? I don't know. But yeah, that's interesting. Was exactly right. not the big forested area. There was a limited forest area that potentially. You guys getting Chloe breaking up? Yeah, I can't, I can't hear yeah, that. he's okay. he's got to come go out and come back in or something. Yeah, Chloe bounce and come back in. I'll okay. uh, uh, I'll float some things in the meantime. Um, yeah, thank you, Bob. I mean, this is all very revealing. Um, so just to just to go over that again, there were no um, there were no restraint marks on the body that showed. So we can say it's post mortem because the marks that would be there if it was anti mortem or para mortem were not there. Yeah, there. So there, you can see there are some visible marks, but the the medical examiner Werner Spitz and those that had looked at them determined that, that that they would have been shortly after death, but not not what we would expect. Correct, because two of the boys were them. alive when they were thrown in, so they were definitely tied. Yeah, my bad. Okay. Yeah. Um, right. Okay. We'll come back to that. Uh, <laughs> Jac- Jacoby. Uh, I mean, if he saw those footprints of course one person that's that's your offender i agree um mm-hmm. how is jacoby's reliability uh in my opinion very good I've, I've spent a lot of time with him i've interviewed him on multiple occasions uh he's walked me through a lot of what happened that night which i was also able to confirm with pam hicks now was pam hobbs at the time terry hobbs's wife um there were some strange things you know but, but you know i, I don't want to get too into the the whodunit part of it, I, I think, sure. think it's a good idea to focus on the crime scene. But there was a lot of weird, you know, he saw that the, the water in the bayou was raging so hard and it was almost dark that he went back and tried it, it to Terry Hobbs, who he had rode with, and said, let's go drive around to the other side and go check in that little patch of woods over there. And Terry dropped him off at his house and said he was going to go change and then never came back. And so he kind of went through most of the night thinking, wow. well, they must have found him. Until Pam ends up screaming in his front yard hours later because Terry had also dropped her off at home and then went out looking and and never came back. So then he, she walked over to, to David Jacoby's house. Uh, but as far as those those memories, I mean, we did some cognitive interviews with him and stuff and had him really to try to figure out like time of day, what things were looking like, so, you know, you know, how you do with, you know, what did you smell? What how did what was the color? You know, and he's, you know, the sky looked purplish, you know, when he could picture it in his mind and he remembers he could see across the creek. But it wasn't clear. It was like that 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 bit of twilight where you could see, but things are blurry and colors aren't really popping anymore. Uh, you know, so it, it it was very vivid in his mind. I, I'll say this: I believe very much that he believes that's what he saw. Has he been alibi? The location. 
has Jacoby well, does, he have an, does Jacoby have an alibi that has been you know it's the checked out? Well, it, the problem was nobody, and, and then I think that's the biggest problem with this with this case. And the and and as you guys know, the first thing that we should do, and what I did when I started investigating it was, first things first, we start with victimology, and that's what the investigators never do. I mean, they went door to door all over that neighborhood. We have, and we got a ton of information from people in the neighborhood about what Stevie, Michael, and Christopher were doing that day. I mean, I mean, sightings of them all over the place. We actually were able to piece together, you know, uh, interactive maps where we show where they were sighted, where they were at. And for example, Chris Byers, we know from John Mark Byers, his stepdad or his adopted father, that he had gotten in trouble. He had he had spanked him, and then he went to go pick up Ryan at the uh, at court. His his brother at court, and came back, and he was gone. Well, what mo- a lot of people don't realize is there was a kid named Bobby Posey who told police that that um, Chris had come to his house after that and told him his dad his daddy had whipped him and he's running away. And I think that's a critical piece of of information to have for victimology because you know that this this at least one of these victims wasn't just out playing he was running away from something now john mark byers in my opinion is fully alibied i've spoken with ryan who doesn't you know john's passed away now but uh you know ryan has nothing nice to say about john mark byers in his mind he really thinks that from what he's told me that he really thinks that uh john mark byers had something to do with this mm. but ryan doesn't know the timeline and doesn't realize that he is John's alibi because John was, you know, Chris was alive. Melissa, his mother saw him in the driveway. Mark left to go pick up Ryan. She still sees Chris out in the driveway. She hears him come in the house, hears him leave while Mark's gone. We know from Ryan that, that, that John, John, John Mark was with Ryan at that time when he went missing. So that's the only reason we have an alibi for him, we have a, we have Todd uh, Moore, who was out of town trucking. He is yeah. alibi. Terry Hobbs, as was mentioned, that there was never any DNA taken from him. There was he was never interviewed. The police never went to his house, so there was no there was never any focus on victimology. So we don't really know what was going on with with Stevie, other than he was supposed to be home before uh, uh, Terry left to, to take Pam to work, and he didn't show up on time. So all we can we can we can pull out of that is that he was likely in trouble, but we don't know anything anything more beyond that. The police never went to his house. They never interviewed Terry. They never pulled any forensics from Terry or any. They had such blinders on, as as Cloyd mentioned. They had they they had they were they were doing a suspect based investigation. They when they should have been doing an evidence based investigation. And if they had done a true evidence-based investigation, I don't think you ever land on these three teenagers at all. No, you know they picked them as a suspect from the very beginning, and then tried to build a case around them, and then they to, by ignoring everything else. Yeah, Bob, I had a question, and I wanted to obviously part of this is going to be audio; it's not going to be video so much. But um, getting an idea, a sense of that location, you mentioned it was like a football field wide. I'm I'm thinking back to the original documentary; they did a good job painting a picture showing you what it looked like pulling the bikes up out of the water on that bridge um how accessible was this area you know you mentioned footprints being on that bridge from somebody coming back could you have gotten it gotten to this area on the other side what is it like getting in and out of this area how easy to navigate very easy it was it was regularly used i interviewed another uh in, in fact when i was looking for bobby posey it's kind of a george foreman situation uh bobby posey's brother robert posey um, I, I accidentally found him, um, looking for Bobby and, and he used to work at that truck wash and lived in those apartments. And that was how he went to work all the time. He just walked across the pipe bridge and they walked. Wow. So there was, there was a trail right across it. And if you go back and watch the documentary, when they're pulling the bikes out, mm-hmm. you can actually see, so you get an idea of the view you had there. You can see the apartment buildings behind it. They're right mm-hmm. there. I mean, I mean, there, you could, I always had a stone's throw. And the first time I went to the crime scene, I literally went out and threw a stone just so I could officially say it was a stone's throw, uh, stone's throw away where that, that house was on the Southeast side and where the apartment building was on the Southwest side. So there was that dead end street. And when you, when you go past that dead end street, you just literally walk, I don't know, 20, 30 yards. And then it goes 
down a little hill down to the pipe and there was a trail beat down right into it going to the still on this side of the bridge there was a trail going from there to the east that went into what they called the robin hood woods which was just a big open field area with some woods where there was a bunch of you know people would ride atvs bikes and stuff back there that led down to the bridge so there was two very clear trails that led to the bridge on the south side on the neighborhood side and then on the north side you can see again in those videos in paradise laws and the crime scene photos there are beaten down paths from people crossing it and then going out to the to the west towards there was a truck stop over there and then up to where the um, uh, the truck wash was, which are two different places kind of next to each other. And then one that just kind of goes up into the woods is an area to kind of go hang out. So a, a perpetrator could have come in from either side, but it sounds like you mentioned the footprints being on this bridge. Maybe it was them coming back towards the one side heading in that direction. Yeah, I mean, if, the, if, the, if those tracks are, if, if Jacoby's memory is accurate about the tracks, I don't see how there's any other explanation for it. It wasn't wet out, right? So, like, just walking in that area out there in Robin Hood Woods, all that area around there, it's all sandy. There's not, there's no reason to have mud on your feet unless you were down in that mucky creek where the bodies were found. You know, that's where you would get, you would pick up the mud that would then still be on your feet when you come back. And then, Kind of, if you start to piece together this this scene in your mind, the boys ride their bikes to. And another, I should mention that Bobby Posey that said Chris was running away. He mentions a, a kid named Carlos Seals. We tracked down Carlos Seals and and he said, "Yeah, I saw the boys that day. We were and he lived up on uh, I think Goodwin and you know right um, W E Cat Street, and we believe he was the last person to see the boys alive. He said they went by on their bikes." He thought he remembered seeing like a, a sleeping bag or something on the front of the bikes. And they took off into, into Robin Hood because they were running, running away. So, but, but, but to me, when you, when you have in your mind that you have these victims who are running away, they're running away from something. Now, I'm not saying that that something is the person that killed them, but it sure as hell is the first place you should start looking. What are they running away from? Because if they're running away from something and then they end up dead, very likely the thing that they were running away from the person they were running away from is how they ended up dead. Um, and, and doc, you mentioned control. Um, that's one thing that kind of threw me to beginning too, was how, you know, how does one person, cause I, I truly believe there's a single perpetrator here. Um, and, but then you look at it, that's what tells me, I think this is an authority figure mm. because how do you control three, eight year old boys? Well, it's pretty, especially if, if say you, let's say uh, one scenario, you snap and you smack one over the head and it knocks him unconscious or kills him and you didn't mean to. And the other two eight-year-olds are standing there. Yeah. A parent, a scout leader, a teacher, a coach says, you boys stop right there. You know, it's not like a, a adult, it doesn't take a knife. It doesn't take a gun. It literally takes stop Fear. right there or I'm going to do that to you. And they stop right there. And then it's yeah. pretty easy to grab them. And then, you know, then two of the boys, you know, we have Michael Moore has a head injury uh, mm. that appears to be perimortem. And then the other ones were drowned. So uh, that would be true of a, of, of a stranger too, though. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, yeah, I, I, I think that would depend stranger. on the boys' personalities, but, yeah. but for sure. Yeah. An adult, any adult really becomes an authority figure to an eight year old. <laughs> right. Yeah. I think, I think, uh, I think, you know, to your point, an authority figure, someone that the kids would respect. Okay. That's so-and-so's parent. That's whoever it is. That's one way to control them there because they have that. And, or someone with a gun, I can't see one person doing this without either having that authority figure or a weapon to control them. But, um, you know, I think if, more, if it was a stranger, it's just some creep out in the woods that attacked one of my, I, I don't see how he controls one single person controls these three different kids, like you mentioned, because they're terrified. Yeah, yeah. Well, I and there's, there's I, no I, easy way out. Well, there's. I mean, it's it's not that wide a distance to you know. You think one of these kids is going to run, you know? So I I think Bob's on the money. That this is someone in authority where they're like, okay, we're going to listen to what they say, or it's more than one person, or it's somebody that has a gun, something to control them. I think knife. one of them would have tried to run if they could have. Uh, that leads me to believe that something along the scenario Bob mentioned is, is what happened, probably. You well, got to remember, and, and, they're eight. They're not 14. 
right? right. It's a, little, a lot easier to control three eight year olds with threats. Right. And, three and, and the other thing, you have, especially you just busted it, one of their heads, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that plays into that too, again, is the location because these they didn't have far to run. Like where their bodies were found in 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 twenty five steps. They are out in the clear in front of an apartment building, like mm -hmm. they, they were not deep anywhere. And in, in the other direction, they're they're at the at the truck stop. So, you know, I I, I definitely see Doc's point. I think that, that that's true to an extent. And again, I really think it depends on. That's why victimology is so important. It really depends on the the personalities of the kids you're dealing with. Do you have kids that are generally defiant? I think if you have kids that are generally defiant, if one gets whacked and some stranger did it and says, you stop right there, they're going to say F you and take off and run. Uh, mm -hmm. As opposed to, oh, this is somebody that knows my mom and knows my dad and is going to tell them I'm not listening if they're not mm -hmm. defiant. I think it, it depends. But again, they would know. It, it's hard to get out of the mindset that they're like in the deep woods somewhere. Uh, but you really, I think it really makes a huge difference when you understand that it's a quick scramble and they're around people, uh, which, which again, I think factors hugely into the amount of time that the offender spent concealing this crime. The, I mean, you talk about risk factor. They have three dead eight-year-olds. There are people washing semi-trucks 40 yards away from them. Right there. I mean, right fucking there sorry i don't know if you cuss in your show uh yes we do but they're, <laughs> but they're right there and across yeah. the way there's people out behind the apartments barbecuing and and all this stuff is going on there's people everywhere and you're sitting here with three bodies as i think it was cloyd mentioned what's the first initial reaction that anybody's going to do in most circumstances like this is get the hell out of there mm. the only reason <laughs> to stay there is because you know that if these bodies get found you're going to be the first person they're looking at, so you can't let them get found. That's that's my take on it. Well, don't matter, Bob, Bob, were there any ahead. reports of any screams or anything like that? You know, mentioned forty you know yards away. You think somebody would hear screaming or something coming from out of there? Was there any reports of any of that? No, there weren't. But also remember, it's a it's a it's a semi truck wash, so you've got you know there's a lot of noise going on. Heavy and, equipment and stuff, yeah. And, and the highway know, is right there it, on the it, on the it, north it, side. Screams. Before, before they don't scream in these situations, it, it can happen, and not, uh, there's no sound, very little sound. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's mostly television. Be yeah. Before we move on, I, I do want to stay on this stuff because I want to. I want this to be useful to you, Bob. I know you've done a lot of work in this. So before we we just move on from anything you said, I do. I do want to push back on some stuff. That's only mm -hmm. so that we we can get the right answer. Sure. Um, yeah. So. There was a time uh, when I was growing up, I was a teenage, teenage boy, and the, this guy pulled a knife on me and my friends, and mm -hmm. we didn't run. One of, the, one of us ran, but it was like, you've got a moment to make that decision. And yeah. at that point in time, it just seemed like it was going to be a better option to kind of talk this person down. Now, to say that mm -hmm. I consciously chose to do that, right? It, I, I can't even say that. It's, it's almost retroactive that I'm putting sure. that on it. But whatever it was that occurred to me and uh, two of the other four people there at that time, three, three of us decided not to run. And, you know, thankfully that guy did go away. Uh, and we didn't scream. And, we, we, you know, there's these things that do seem obvious in retrospect. But just in my experiences... You don't know how you're going to react. How you know? old were I you? Agree. Though, I agree completely. How old were you? I was 16. Well, that's a big difference from you know these young kids. I've got a seven year old, and I'm imagining him in the same situation, and I'm thinking he would probably be frightened and, and stay there. And I'm just getting that vibe from from them. Um, but at the same time, I think instinct will kick in if if you see two kids getting attacked that you're with. I think the third one would make a break for it. Um, and they may but, have uh, you been, know, been, been caught really quickly, once again, because they're kids, right? There's there's wounds from behind, aren't there, on some of the children? No, the, all, no. all of the wounds are from the front. The, the, all of, none of them were from the crime. They're, they're all post-mortem, with, oh. the, with, with the exception of the one wound on Michael's head 
had indications yeah. that it that it could have been perimortem or either at the time he was either as he was dying or just before he died but literally and that's why the investigators blew this from the very beginning every single wound on their body was caught what number one happened post-mortem and very very clearly and pretty obviously i mean we had we had um not entomologist, but a reptile herpetologist. There's herpetologist. Her- herpetologist. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> herpetologist. <laughs> yeah, we had a herpetologist come in. We had medical examiners look at this. It's all animal predation. All of it. Every single wound mm-hmm. on their bodies. They were drowned. It was simple. Uh, Doctor Shu, who came on our on, on the show and examined this, these were simple drownings, with the exception of the injury to Michael Moore's head. They were drowned. Everything that you see on the body is a misdirect. It all happened after they were under the water and killed. Okay, so what is so this person holding them down, holding their heads how, down in the water? How are these you two boys uh-uh. allowing, did this allow themselves to be tied up and thrown in, two of the boys? They were tied up post mortem Afterwards. Yeah, afterwards. So how yeah. did this person get them in the water to drown in the first place if they're not tied up before so, they're dead? My, my, my opinion is sitting there. My, my opinion a, on this. <laughs> Oh, sorry. No, you go ahead. Go right ahead. Okay. Well, my my opinion on on on, the, on this topic is, I think one boy was was killed, probably in a fit of probably accident. Probably was not intending to kill them, and the other two boys, I think, were drowned uh, as as witnesses. And again, you have eight year old boys weighing fifty pounds. One person can grab two kids by their by the nap of their neck, by the clothes in the back of their and hold them out of the water that is it, that is that easy that that's one of the ways it was done but but to be very clear those bindings have nothing to do with the murders they were they were killed and uh, now i can't say there's no medical evidence to prove this this is my theory i believe they were killed then their clothes were stripped off and i say that because we know the bindings were then applied post-mortem after they the were bind- already the, dead yeah the clothes have to be off when the bindings go on, that's that's hundred percent. Yeah, you know mm-hmm. that's just order of operations. So we, we and, and we that there. Yeah. yeah, and we see if the utility just... in the bindings that their purpose was to keep the bodies under the water. So that that's why they were that's why they were bound. It was to keep them. You could tie water... them with their clothes on. Why take the clothes off just to bind them? Well, it's clothes it could fill be a... up with water and float. Exactly right. Yeah, there's a couple of there's a couple of things. My I, and this is this is not fact. This is just my my theory. I believe there was probably an attempt to stick to put them in the water, and and there's current and they're flowing and the clothes are catching and they're floating up and there's pieces of them showing. So I think they probably took them back out. Decided that's when they decided to quick take the clothes off and and put them in. Another theory is that this person knows that that area is full of turtles. I mean, mm-hmm. full of them. We, I went down there and did tests. I took a, a, a raw chicken carcass on a rope, dropped it down in the water, and put GoPros on it. The GoPro battery lasts two hours. I came back two hours later and pulled up bones, and it was and it wasn't snapping turtles. There are snappy turtles in there, but it, on the camera we see these little like red-eared sliders, painter turtles, stuff like that. The minute they get a scent of that of that flesh in the water, hundreds of them came. And rip this things to shred. So it's uh, one theory is that the offender knew the area, knew that those turtles were in there, and wanted their clothes off so that the turtles could just literally eat the bodies. Yeah, I have Wouldn't a question. Wouldn't that be taking a lot of extra time taking clothes off afterwards? Though, I mean, if someone is interested in getting too. away from there, mm. I mean, if they did, that's great for DNA later on. But to yeah. me, it seems like taking clothes, shoes, socks pants underwear shirts off of three little boys would take dead little boys would take an awful lot of time yeah. <laughs> you're dressing my son to get him ready for school and how much of a pain in the ass it is yeah. right yeah. <laughs> right now i'll, I'll say yeah. that um jim clementi also a you know an fbi profiler he be- he believes uh that it's possible that whoever came upon them that not that it was a sexually motivated crime at all but the thing that they saw was maybe that the boys were back there skinny dipping, that they were, you know, they, they were already back there naked. I don't tend to believe that this water was pretty. Um, so it, imagine chocolate milk. That's what this water looked like. 
Like if you took your hand and went an inch under it, you couldn't see it. It wasn't particularly hot. It was nighttime or getting to be evening when the mosquitoes and stuff are out. But that's that's he thinks that that's a a possibility that it could have been that was whacked. Uh, me. Three kids are just gonna get undressed and go in this creek in this nasty water. Uh, I don't buy that for a second. I think it's unlikely. I have I have a question about the head injuries. My uh -huh. reading of the autopsy report showed that all three boys had skull fractures and brain hemorrhage. You just said that only one of them did? Because what I was thinking is that they were knocked unconscious, hit mm. over the head, and then all of the instrumental stuff to put them in the water and hide the bodies. I would, I would have to review that again, but my memory of it, and it's been a couple of years of it, was that Michael Moore, and maybe it was just that Michael Moore's um, injury was the one that th that had indications that it was done while he was still alive, uh, mm -hmm. and I, I remember yeah. he okay. had the big the, the brain you know the the brain hemorrhage uh, that was that went along with that. I don't recall mm -hmm. there being skull fractures with the other two, but that but I could be mistaken again. It's been a couple of years since I've been through it. Well, if there were skull fractures and uh, hemorrhage in the brain, they were liable to happen. Yeah, right. You have a skull fracture when you're post mortem, but you can't have hemorrhage. It doesn't happen. Right. right. Because what, what I'm seeing happening is exactly what you said and what Lee said. One of them, somebody flips, flips a switch. They hit one of the boys and then they have to, you know, take care of the other two as witnesses in a panic. And if they were hit over the head first, that would explain that and how they could be rendered unconscious and then manipulated after that. Yeah, that, that, that's very possible. I just, I don't remember that being... I said, what I, what I have in my mind when Dr. Shu was looking at it was, was the words her saying that mm -hmm. these were a simple drowning. Like that's how they okay. died was a drowning. And, and I'm, I, I'm going by Peretti's reports, which aren't necessarily reliable. So, right, which were but, refuted but by but every you can other also, afterwards. <laughs> you can also be knocked unconscious and then still drown, correct? Yeah, so, exactly. I yes. mean, yes. they're hit yes. over the head and they're unconscious and then put in the water. They can still, you know, yeah. breathe in that. Uh, water and and yeah. actually the cause then is drown drowning um, exactly. yeah. and I don't remember either but it se it seemed like more than one had head injuries but I don't yeah I, I, I haven't so. looked at that's, it for a while either and that's was. what makes sense to me that these yeah. kids were incapacitated you know yeah. like it doesn't I don't know how you control all these children unless there's some incapacitation or like you said unless they were both held down and drowned at once but even that I think I, I agree it would be easier with eight-year-old children, but I still think it would be potentially difficult, and it would make more sense to me if there was some incapacitation mm -hmm. first. Absolutely. Yeah. Or and multiple you offenders. If you want to go, if you want yeah. to go drowning without incapacitation, then you're go I think it's more likely multiple offenders. That goes against mm -hmm. the Jacoby thing, but then there's there's all that, right? <laughs> it's a, yeah. it's a puzzle. We got to solve one little bit of it at a, at a time. Um, I think it might be nice to take a couple comments and then hear what Susanna has to say on the DNA. Okay. She hasn't gotten a chance to give her thing. So Rena Middoff says, Doc was saying this could have been, could have sexual attributes or sexual reason for this happening. Do you agree, Bob? Uh, I, I, I absolutely follow the train of thought there particularly the fact that they're naked is always going to bring that into question. Uh, it, it, in my opinion, I don't think that there was a sexual element to this. To me, this seems very much more like uh, punishment, which, which, which doc pointed out, you know, punishment and a sexual element can be, can be tied together. Um, but I, th I think that the, in my opinion, a big issue with this case is, is the red herrings, right? So the, the mutilation to the bodies led him to believe satanic, you know, the, right. they were naked. So it could be said not that you did this, but the original investigators, it must be sexual. I don't think there's a sexual component. I think this was, I think this was an authority figure, I think. And, and I think that it was punishment and then witnesses killed. I agree with you. It's all in the details, right? It's the order of operations. And that's right. why I, I, I'm so annoying and pedantic and I don't mean to be, but I just, there's some things I don't want to move past quickly because if we know that thing, you know, like whether the clothes were on um, when they were hit or whether they were on after, th that's so important in figuring out what happened, like the motive yeah, and I, everything. Obviously, if the clothes were on when they were, when they were um, attacked, um, it probably wasn't a sex 
sexually motivated. Yeah. And, and unfortunately that's, there's, there's a lot of elements like that, that I just don't think we can know. So we kind of got to bifurcate our, our hypothesis, right? So if okay. this, then this, mm -hmm. and if this, then that. Right. Uh, for me, like one of the things with, with the documentary that, you know, your, your documentary, Bob, that I had watched, one of the things that was kind of chilling to me, which was that one of the children, um, John Mark Byers, or it was, we were talking with Ryan Clark and he said that the punishment was go stand in the kitchen with your pants down and wait for me to come and spank you or whip right. you. And so then these kids are found without clothing on. And it was that part of the control, you know, if it was an adult or someone they knew, um, you're going to be punished in this, you know, as part of a control mechanism. But so if, so that's why I'm kind of confused if you're saying that these, clothes you don't think the clothes were taken off until afterwards um i i had always kind of thought of it as perhaps a way of controlling these kids are they less going to be less likely to run away if they're completely naked too that that's a, a very good possibility and it's another another scenario that jim clementi had brought up was that mm -hmm. you know perhaps it was done exactly that now again i want to point out that we know there's a lot of reasons to not like mark byers uh and maybe like him for this but you know he, we know where, where he was at, but the, but the, but the, the thought is there. The, 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 the methodology is, is there. Right. Uh, and I think that was one of the things that Jim had mentioned too, that maybe they said, take your clothes off at gun as, point a, or either. as that control yeah. method. Yeah. Gunpoint. I was, I was going to say, I've always thought that if they had a weapon, they would have used it. Um, but maybe not a gun because of the proximity to yeah. everybody. Yeah. And the sound, but you could yeah. control the kids at least and get them to do what you want with the threat of a gun. Right. The, uh, Looking at something categorical, like they were undressed for this, um, it's it's often kind of false. I mean, things can serve multiple purposes. So you're right, Susanna, you take their clothes off, they, they don't run. But it can also be that they're humiliated, and humiliation is um, arousing to someone who's sexually sadistic, right? Who has a mm -hmm. sexually sadistic pedophilic interest. And... Um, also, also, too, if you, know, if you do have that pedophilic interest, seeing the boys naked as as well right so it can be multiple things and it, it could be almost goes back to the offenders punishment that they received when they were a child potentially right mm -hmm. someone who molested them or, or something like it did that to them maybe it was a father or uncle and um so then they've got that in there and they're kind of downloading what happened to them in the past onto these victims you know one thing yeah. that you said earlier about they took the clothes off so they wouldn't float bob it it isn't the clothes that makes a body float. And it, it, the fact that these bodies would never be found, that's not realistic either. The bodies will float up once decomposition happens because of the uh, the gases in the body. That's what brings them to the surface. It didn't have enough time in this case because they were found within a day or so. But the, I, I, you know, the fact is people, fully clothed people, stand or water a long time all the time. I've never known anything that the clothes makes them float. Mm -hmm. It's so, it's not that it the idea isn't that it that it makes them float. It's a you're talking about a, a two foot deep flowing creek. So, right. it's, so it's not I, I miss maybe misspoke if I said float. What I meant is the current catches the clothes and kind of makes a sail and then brings okay. the you know brings yeah. the body to the surface. And as and, and as far as I mean, this person almost got away with it. You know, that that area was searched multiple times before someone happened to see a shoe floating in the, in the water as far as, so as far as like the bodies never being found, they used those, the shoestrings, wrapped them around sticks, pinned them down to the bottom. So there's like stuffed into the mud so that they, they are staying underwater. And then you have water that is full, uh, completely full of these, uh, of these turtles that are going to eat any kind of flesh they come across. I mean, realistically in a week or shoot a couple of days, there could have been nothing left but bone that is just getting covered mm -hmm. in silt and mud and dirt in that creek. I mean, they literally could have hidden those bodies forever had that one shoe not floated up. Yeah, but yeah, I've, point, I've handled uh, submerged bodies and murders where there's turtles and stuff. Like I said, there were bites. They're going to chew on them. The body's going to pop up before the turtles could completely yeah. devour them. It's going to happen. Well, and, and right. We're, but, we're but not you're talking, talking about creek. We're talking a two foot deep creek aren't we bob isn't that the depth is you yeah, know even high, even high, even high, only a few feet well and, and, and i want to stress too the bodies weren't going to pop up because they were pinned down 
They were, yeah, they but were, they, that, they, that, they that were, the turtle's going to eat that. through the carpet. Like, Loading the body bark. will overwhelm that. I've had people with rocks yeah. on them and stuff in much, much deeper water, and they'll pop yeah. up. It's going to happen. But it's not, something... Maybe they thought they would never pop up, but they were wrong. And that that's was going to be my point, is that you're thinking about, with your knowledge of how things are going to happen, be in the mind of the killer who doesn't know these things. Right. And this is right. what they think is going to happen. Right. Right. Yeah, they may have thought that, but they were wrong. Well, yeah. uh, and I, I'm curious because we, we have a situation, okay, is this someone that accidentally hurts one of the kids and says, oh, shit, now I've got to eliminate these witnesses. A lot of thought goes into this process afterwards. I right, got to take the clothes off, got to pin them down, got to tie them. Is, is there any possibility that this is some kind of pre-planned attack? Because you know, you just attacked three kids on a spur of the moment. You didn't mean to do it. It got out of control. Do you have the thought process to carry all this out? Is there any possibility that this is something that was planned ahead of time and they had some kind of uh, plan here? What do you guys think? Well, no. there's there's no way that anyone could have. There's no one that any no way that anyone could have known that those three boys would be in that place at that time unless they were following them there. Another misconception is that. The three boys were playing together all afternoon. That's not true. Uh, when you go through the the door to door details, you find out that they were actually separated for most of the time. There, you know, Stevie and Michael left together. Christopher was playing on his own. At some point, they met up with another boy uh, and met up with Christopher. Then they separated again. And then there's a period of time around I want to say five o'clock where Michael is all by himself. Christopher is at home getting mm -hmm. punished, and we don't know where Steve is. Like they were, so they were separated this whole time, and then they happened to all come back together, and then ride their bikes uh, back door towards this place. So as far as like pre-planning, I don't, I don't think there's any way anybody could have known. I mean, remember, Steve was supposed to be home at four thirty. You know, he wasn't. He mm -hmm. definitely was. And and Christopher was supposed to be home cleaning the carport. So no one. So there's. So the idea of somebody now, could somebody have thought in their, you know, a sick individual have thought in their mind. If I ever killed somebody, this is how I would do it. Maybe, but I don't think anybody could have pre-planned to kill these three boys in that location. But if, if so, if, wouldn't they have brought their own ligatures? Yes, that's what I'm about yeah. to say. You would have brought your own tools. <laughs> What's the point in planning it and then you don't bring anything, right? I mean, to make mm -hmm. it easier, yeah. right? And then plan could to somebody... do it in the worst place ever to possibly do it because it's surrounded yeah. by people. Now, could yeah. somebody have seen them go down in there and followed them? Is there any possibility in your mind that could have happened? If what you broke up a little bit, could what have happened? If somebody saw them heading down there and took the opportunity to follow them down there, yeah, I think so. I think that that's a possibility. I think either either that happened, or someone who was looking for them saw the bikes on setting down on the ground mm -hmm. right next to the pipe bridge. Thought, oh, they must have gone across this pipe bridge, and then once you get to the other side, there's, I mean, you, you walk in the woods, you can see the entire woods from right there. It's a small patch of land. The other option is that the perpetrator or perpetrators is already down there. So the well, boys go down and they come across someone who's already there for whatever reason, maybe a nefarious reason or, uh, you know, so we can't rule that out too. Or can we? Yeah. They walk on up on something like they're not, somebody doesn't want them to see or tell about maybe. And that, yeah. that leads me to a question. Um, jump ahead a little bit to Aaron Hutchinson. Hutchison, is there a possibility that any part of his statement was true? It's so hard to tell, in my opinion. It was, it was so manipulated and twisted and, and right. fabricated. It's so hard to pull what could be true and what could, there's the, there's elements the of it that we know couldn't be. Right. So it's the hard thing to know that what stuck does. out to me was his first interview where he says that the boys used to go down and watch men doing what men and women do. Now he's eight years old. He didn't say having sex. It, it almost smacks to me of knowledge beyond his years. Mm -hmm. And it makes me wonder if that, what part, just that part was true. Mm -hmm. it, it and, very well could be. And that, that maybe if it's true that that's what they were doing was going to watch that again, that could be something that when they get found out, get caught for watching could trigger that kind of a reaction. And you don't want to get into, once again, don't get into categoricals. Like was it a, a hookup place or was it drugs or was it, it's, it's probably all these things, right? Um, right. 
It could be any I'll, scenario. I know from just you know growing up in the town where I was, if there was a patch of wilderness, people were doing things in that they shouldn't have been. Mm-hmm. Just as a rule yeah. of thumb. Yeah, yeah but and, if they're walking up on one person, I mean, it seems to me like it could be a scenario where they, if they walk up on anyone doing something, it's walking up on more than one person. What would yeah. one person be doing out there by themselves that would be nefarious? I could see some kind of, you know, somebody doing drugs together or two guys having some kind of uh, relationship, uh, something along those lines, them walking up on something like that and them not wanting to be found out. Yeah, I, I think that's that's always a possibility. Again, it'd be a weird place to do that. There's plenty of better places that were more concealed than that location to do it. Um, as far as like to have that kind of gathering, the place where Aaron Hutchinson said that happened was one of those places, which was in the Robin Hood Woods, the other side of the mm-hmm. bayou, the huge the patch of side. woods on on the other side. Um, but then again, I think you, you, to me, I'm always looking at the behaviors exhibited by the offenders on the crime scene, particularly. Uh, post post murder, right? So after they've already they've already killed them, those and I'd be curious to see what your guys' opinions on that. But so now these strange strangers come in, or maybe not strangers come in and they kill them. These people think people don't know they're there, right? So as far as they no one knows they're there, they wouldn't be there. Do they then spend the time to go through all the efforts to conceal the bodies, or do they just get the hell out of there? Yeah, they I may. mean that's a good point. It's a good point because. You know, if, if this place is as heavily used as as you made it sound that people cut through there all the time and it's not very wide to begin with, you know, you've got a, a risk of somebody walking up on you while you're taking the time to do all this stuff. So that that's a yeah. little bit odd to me that somebody spends that much time there doing this. I don't know how long the whole thing would have taken them from start to finish till they're out of there, but it seems risky. Yeah. Can I say I just, something I just about step the... for one second? Yeah. I'll be right back. Sure, sure. Something so... about time it takes to take the clothes off. We're not talking, I don't think, button down shirts or any intricate type of clothing. It would be very quick and very easy to just pull the shirt off, flip them upside down, pull the pants off, shoes, socks, and underwear, and you're done. I, I don't see that it would take that much time. I just don't I understand disagree. the whole reason. I don't understand. <laughs> yeah, I, somebody with Extra somebody that has training. to get my kid undressed and dressed for school and stuff. It's a pain in the ass. Presuming and they're if, conscious, it, I think it would be just as hard things. if they're unconscious. Either way, it's going to be hard, in my opinion, to undress three boys, and and then they've got to tie them up and do this other stuff that goes on there. Um, uh, again, I've got a seven year old, and I'm telling you right now, it's it's not an easy task getting them dressed when he's willing to help me and work with me. So in a situation where he's not, yeah, but you're putting clothes on, not taking them off, taking them off. It can be a chore too. Trust me. Here's a question. If if you're going to undress them and it's not sexual, why do you take the underwear off? That that's why I'm wondering. Cloyd. I don't get it. There you go. Thank you, Cloyd. Silver bullet. There it is. Thank you. Thank you. There it is. I missed the silver bullet. We we, we had a breakthrough. man. (laughs) Yeah, we solved it. I don't know about that. But if you're undressing them and it's not sexual, why do you take the underwear off? You take the pants, the shirt's not sure, the shoes, the socks. That's a good point. But why the there underwear? There you go. Now that we have a motive. I think there was a sexual element to this. It may not have been ahead. initial. I mean, maybe it came up after the fact, and you know, or whatever, but yeah, you don't take the underwear off. You, you just Unless it's the- some sort of humiliation thing. It's what not separate. That? What have I been saying? No okay. categories. It's oh. a, it's a blur, <laughs> man. The other thing is, worried about finding out and all the time you take. That's what happened. They did do that. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't matter if they worried about the time it took to do it. They did do it. There's no question yeah. about it. It happened. So I mean, that apparently right. wasn't a concern of theirs at the time because it happened. That's the best evidence we have of that. Now, I know they went down a rabbit hole here, Bob, and, and focused on these three kids early on and said, okay, it's Satan worship. I know that angle happened. But in hindsight, were there any suspects in the area, any people with crimes against boys? You know, you mentioned that the houses are right there. There's a truck stop, or a truck place right there. Anybody with any kind of record that should have been looked at that wasn't maybe? I think when we, I mean, there was in that neighborhood, there was all kinds of, of 
different offenders and records, uh, people with records in the area. I don't remember off the top of my head specifically uh, about sexual crimes, um, particularly with children, but that, but that was, that was kind of the, the point is they weren't, they weren't looking at, I mean, I mean, we're talking about, was there anybody in the neighborhood with a, a rap sheet of, of sexual crimes? They didn't go to Stevie's house. Yeah, that's they that's, sure that's, as hell weren't going that far. They and the answer is yes, by that. the way. <laughs> There's yeah, always they're, they're, they're yeah. Awesome. Yeah. But yeah. the other thing is people waste their time all the time looking for the fiend or the boogeyman. When in reality, a lot of these people have never been handled for this before, right? I mean, I don't know a case like this where it was a known sexual offender that actually ended up being a guy. It was a sexual offender, all right, but they were unknown. Nobody knew they were sexual offenders. So, I mean, you can do that. It's always, you know, due diligence. But in my experience, that rarely leads to a, to a solve on these because you're wasting your time. I think we've got to move to to um, some comments, obviously, but then we've also got to get into like the DNA part because it's going to come up to you know, close to home. And a lot of these crimes, when somebody's murdered, it's somebody close to them. I think Bob mentioned that earlier that he thought that could be a possibility. And some DNA comes back here. I don't want to spoil anything for anybody that doesn't know, but we'll get into that. But maybe take some comments and then get into the DNA and let Susanna weigh in on that. I've had my breakthrough there, so okay. we can move on. Yeah, thank you, Chloe. Okay. Uh, Jim Maras asks, or he says, I've spent the night in that truck stop, all kinds of riffraff. Sure, there are. Yeah. Yeah. Any truck stop. Sure. <laughs> yeah. And, and is, this, is, this, is, they... is this a full truck stop, like a like full service truck stop, all kinds of stuff going on, gas, uh, people coming well, that, going? That's what I wanted to, to clear up. The, the, the property adjacent to the woods and the crime scene was not a truck stop. That was a truck wash where wash. semi. Okay. It was beyond that, further to the west, where the the truck stop was. Right. And so it was okay. a little. It wasn't right next door. You'd have to go through the you pass the pass or through the truck wash to get to the woods from the truck stop. Okay. Now my understanding, and I'm not good with maps, but looking at other people's maps that have been done, it looked to me like Bojangles was pretty damn close to the Blue it's Beacon. About a mile. It's a little over a mile away. A little over a mile. As a crow flies. Okay. Uh, which the, you know the the theory that some people have was that that he would have taken the 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 bayou like like stayed stayed low in the bayou all the way through there, but that's just not reasonable. The bayou was, mm -hmm. I've been there when it's been flowing. It's a drainage, right? So there's when there's a lot of rain. It's I've been there when it's been flowing up all the way above the pipe bridge, and I've been down there where it's six foot below the pipe the the pipe bridge in six inches of water. At this time, it was flowing real hard real fast, real full, and it was about a foot underneath the pipe. So you're talking on like seven, eight foot deep water flowing hard and fast mm -hmm. that he would have had to get into, get through, and then get across uh, that mile down the way. And then by a car... The... Oh, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, and then by car, like I said, it, it feels like it's in, it's really not that far, but it feels like for because of the route you have to take to get to it. Mm -hmm. Did they spend any time, the police spent any time interviewing the residents of the, was it the Mayflower apartment buildings? I mean, if it was that close and overlooking the woods, and then you, you really don't know, you know, I'm sure there's many, many residents in that, in those, that apartment complex who was, who was spoken to there. Anyone? No, nobody. And that was one of the, uh. they went door to door to a bunch of places. But it's like that Robert Posey, Bobby Posey's brother <laughs> lived in those apartments. And, and when I was with him, he like, called several people that used to live there back then because he's like i don't remember the police ever coming to knock on our door and nobody was and there's no one nowhere in the i think they did talk to one or two people if i remember correctly there were a couple people from the mayfair apartments um but they certainly didn't go through and make sure that they spoke to everyone from every apartment to see what they saw am i correct that the guy i think his name might have last name is hogan he sold ice cream he drove the ice cream truck did he live in the Mayfair apartments? Uh, Terry Hobbs is the one that was driving the ice cream truck. Okay, wait a minute. Ice cream truck. That's what Terry drove. <laughs> not, not, <laughs> not the ding, oh, ding, 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 ding ice cream truck. He delivered. Oh. He delivered. Oh. No, no, no. Cream. Ding, 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 ding ice cream <laughs> oh, truck. He used to sell. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he used to sell ice cream to the boys he didn't know very well. Police questioned him quite a bit. And then I think I think that's the one that they chased down to California. Oh, oh, oh maybe. the kid, uh, Morgan. Uh, what were those names? 
teenagers. What were the oh, two yeah, names? Yeah, that was in Oceanside. They followed Oceanside. him to Oceanside, yeah. which is yeah. the town next to yeah mm-hmm. Carlsbad. Right? Yeah, so that's why I remember that specifically. Mm-hmm. They they interviewed this guy. They followed him to Oceanside and they interviewed there was, him there. There right? was two of them. There was okay. there's a pair of them that moved out there. I remember one of them was named Morgan. Was the last name was Morgan? Yeah, I can't remember. Morgan. What was the other one's name? I don't remember the other one's name, but either. Morgan was the one that said he was in an altered state and he could have very well have done it. He didn't remember. And then yeah, that was later. yeah, yeah. I mean, it, we covered that. I mean, I couldn't tell you the details about it because I don't remember it. If you go to season five of Truth and Justice, there's an episode with his name on it uh, where we went through yes. his interview and stuff, and it was that. I, I, I what I remember is coming away from the thing. It was just complete nonsense. It was right. you know they put they they put him in a room and for hours and and push him and and he came to I don't know maybe I was drugged up or something like that but mm-hmm. nothing as far as I recall nothing nothing added up with him. Mm-hmm. Drew, I'd love you to bring that comment that was just up there about yeah Damien let's Eccles bring that one back up and see what Bob thinks of that. What's that? Uh, I'll read Eccles it. Was a Satanist. Okay, go. Sebastian Longstaff says Damien Eccles was a Satanist who tortured and killed dogs and cats. Miss Kelly confessed to the murders three times. Um, it was seven times, Sebastian. And you're a douchebag who writes comments on the internet. So, yes. I mean, we can't blame everybody for everything. Uh, I-, I love the the Miss Kelly confessed three times. Miss Kelly confessed seven times. First of all, there's one confession, and then there's an attempted repeat of confession multiple times. Right. You don't get to count every single one of them. They've been analyzed by every expert in the world. There's nothing we went through. There's another episode we did in season five where we went through literally piece by piece, word for word, the confession and watched every single piece of information he gave that would all came from the investigator invest mm-hmm. that, that was doing, yep. you know, he said it was down to here, the time's wrong, the, by the, and, and mm-hmm. also when, whenever I'm doing statement analysis on, on any kind of, of confession or statement or anything like this, you know, you look, look for the mistakes, the mistakes that were disproven later through forensics, and then try to find the source of that mistake. And in this case, everything that he said that was later disproven, where that information come from, that's what the original investigators believed. And so you can see that everything came from uh, mm-hmm. from there. And what it's, he it's did a, volunteer, he got wrong. The yeah, strangling, everything. the use mm-hmm. of a stick to crush the throat. He uh, moved the the used. Yeah. He yeah. never, like one of the, in one of them, the the Bible confession or whatever it was, after he got convicted and they convinced him to do, to do it again. And that one, now the story was they were out in the main bayou and that's where it happened and they drowned, which would have been an eight foot of flowing water and directly in mm-hmm. where everybody could look at. Like he never, ever one time got it right. And what anyone should do that's being objective. And I don't think anybody in this panel would disagree with that. Any confession, even if you really Absolutely. think it's the right person, is you have to compare the confession to the evidence to test its veracity. Mm-hmm. And in this case, mm-hmm. like people just will just it's it's amazing to me how willfully ignorant people will be and just completely ignore. Well, he got everything. Well, he was trying to mis- minimize his role. What the hell are you talking about? He said that he grabbed the kid and held him and was there the whole like right. minimizing anything. He was just saying exactly. what they wanted him to say. Mm-hmm. Just to get back to the Satanist thing, too, even if it was true, and I'm not saying it is, but if it was true that uh, Damien Eccles was a Satanist and killed cats and dogs, there's no reason that you would, there's there's nothing that would link us link him to that there's no satanic activity there's no dead cats no, right yeah and there's no satanic rituals there's no no there's no anything that indicates this was a satanic murder at all so it doesn't matter he could be a satanist and a liar and a wife beater and everything else none of that is indicative of what happened on this crime scene there's all kinds there's no- of really bad people in west memphis in 1993 it doesn't mean that they you killed know- these boys there's no and physical that's a- evidence that's it's me. Just- Shaky the san- Sorry, Morph. The sanctimony of people in this town thinking they have the pulse, you know, they have their finger on the pulse of good and evil. And this town is so riddled with bad behavior and, and crime. It just, it blows my mind. Yeah. That's in, that is a, it's a common theme, I think. <laughs> well, when your yeah. world is that town. And the, the surrounding townships, like that's where your yeah. fantasies play out, right? That's where your mm-hmm. notions of good and evil come into play. But it's a satanic panic that, you know, during yeah. that time frame, I grew up in the 80s as a teenager in a small town, had long hair, wore leather jackets, wore a Black Sabbath. 
I cannot uh, see that. Jean jacket. Uh, I you know, I'll see more with hair at all. I'll, I'll, I'll <laughs> show you <laughs> I, had, I had a, yeah. we sold our souls for rock and roll back patch on one of my jeans. Hell jackets. yes. And if something happened like this in my town, I could imagine me and my crew might have been, yeah. hey, check out those weirdos, those devil worshippers. Um, sorry, so what I was that sound called? that mindset. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you yeah, off and, and, and just because someone, even if someone does follow Satan, is a practitioner of Satanism or even Luciferianism, does not mean that they are practicing human sacrifice, does not mean that they are violent. Um, and so the, the equation of even if he was a Satanist doesn't mean he committed these murders. I would go so far. I mean, I've, I've known a lot in my time. Um, it's, it's not the way it is depicted. Um, I know that Damien was questioned on the stand about Alistair Crowley's um, beliefs on human sacrifice and such, but I, I wouldn't necessarily consider Crowley the, uh, the go-to authority. Um, but yeah, again, you know, like I said in the script, it's a, to these people that was a distinction without a difference, whether he practiced Wicca, Satanism, or what. But I've right. never known anyone who is a practitioner of any path in the occult who is violent or into bloodletting or anything like that. Yeah, and and my point is more that it, because keep throughout the course of this investigation, I've gotten to know Damien. And, you know, it's been when I did my season on it and filmed the documentary it was now years ago. Damien has become I consider him a dear friend. He's mm -hmm. a wonderful human. So I'm not I, I'm not. But my point is, even if he was a Satanist who was performing human sacrifice, it right. still doesn't mean he committed this crime. Right. Correct. Right. Correct. And he's not, by the way. But if he was. Yeah. Alex, I like the way that you just dropped your I know Satanist cred to convince the guy that believed that Satanist did it. I get angry with this case. I, I, I'm trying to hold back here. Um, and when I hear that kind of crap, um, yeah. I, 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 I'm He's just going to go, crap. well, you're evil. So that's what you'd say. Well, maybe I am. Yeah. We have a little nugget here just for anybody to appeal them to come over to the scrum. I'm going to send Drew a picture of me from the 80s. Oh, for anyone yay. that comes over yes. to the crumb, I've got to see this. They will get to see me in the 80s. So um, wow. it's, 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 come on, join Patreon and come over to Scrum. Uh, so Susanna was going to do the DNA and we keep getting distracted because there's so much to talk about. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. Come on. DNA. Or lack thereof, right? Mm -hmm. There really isn't much. The only thing is that that hair right so that's um okay so little dna testing done early on a significant amount of testing done 2007 2008 time period and there's not a whole lot to compare right uh, there's there's a lot of just the boy's own dna um but the one piece of evidence that a lot of people, you know, like to talk about or, or, or should talk about, frankly, is there's a hair that was in Christopher or in, I'm messing up the names, in uh, Moore's. Michael Moore's. Shoelace. Michael Moore's shoelace in the ligature, in the knot, in one of the knots, not a ligature, excuse me, but when in one of the knots in the shoelace, there is a hair and, and, you know, at the time we're, if you can't do regular DNA testing, if there's not a root, then the next best thing is mitochondrial DNA testing. And that's what was done in this case. And so that is the one piece of evidence that, you know, is coming back to um, Terry Hobbs, right? But it's not necessarily him, it includes him, right? Mm -hmm. It includes him as a potential contributor because we're talking about mitochondrial DNA. So it could be his hair. It could be a relative of his, a maternal relative, because all maternal relatives would have the exact same mitochondrial profile. Or it could be someone who coincidentally has the same mitochondrial profile. Wouldn't you expect that DNA, though, that to be found if from somebody that's connected, you know, he's connected to the, these kids? Yeah, it, it's it's possible. And, and that's, I think that's what the main thought is. Well, 
these kids spend a lot of time together, hairs are very transferable, it would be possible. Uh, it would be sort of like a, a tertiary transfer, right? So from Terry to his son to Michael Moore, you know? It, well, Michael it Moore had been in his house that day also. Yeah. Okay, right. And we're not talking his blood or semen found on these exactly. kids. We're talking a hair. So, do we also Absolutely. know that were they bound with their own shoelaces, or were they bound potentially with each other's shoelaces? No, and I was going to point that out too. That it was it was Michael Moore's binding. We don't know whose shoelace it is. Right. And and okay. while at the same time Michael Moore was in in Stevie's house for a, a, like a minute enough to walk in and say, "Can Stevie come out and ride his bike that day?" Certainly, there's an opportunity to pick up a hair. In practical terms. You have to then, then, then he didn't take his shoes off, untie them, retie them there. He just went in and went out if he picked up a hair and then rode their bikes around the neighborhood for hours all over the place. But the thing that gets me that's the most important about it is remember those bindings, those, those shoelaces were in their shoes. So they were untied, pulled through every eyelet of the shoe, then retied into the binding. And the hair was found wrapped up in the knot of the binding. So for it to be like a tertiary transfer like that, uh, it, it would be, it would, it would have somehow stayed on the lace through all. And I'm not saying that's impossible, that's but improbable or, or less. It's certainly, yeah. in my opinion, improbable. Yeah. Is it Susanna? But, but there's, it's just, there's just no way to tell, right? I mean, right. It, it could have. <laughs> That's why it's so problematic when you have family members who are potential suspects or you have an accused who is the father, the stepfather, et cetera, of, of a family member. That DNA can get there in so many ways. A hair can get there in so many ways. However, I think one of the things that we, you know, when we talked about with the documentary, I'm looking over the reports, there's actually two hairs, right? So that was something we talked about in the documentary that that other hair has never been tested. Is that also Terry Hobbs? Well, consistent with Terry Hobbs. And then further to that point, let's do additional testing now. There, the testing that's available now with, you know, Astria or Astrea, I always mispronounce, um, that laboratory can do SNP testing that does the genealogical testing. And that will tell us, is it really Terry Hobbs's DNA or is it somebody else? Because we actually don't really know right now. We just know that he's included. And then are both hairs his or not? Um, so, you know, I mean, I think today there's so much more that we can do. We've talked about MVAC, but there's additional testing that, you know, the capabilities, even from the time that, Bob, you and I talked with the documentary there. There's additional um, yeah. possibilities. So, yeah. yeah. And I was shocked when you told me when we were filming for the documentary that you can get full DNA profiles off of a hair without a root. Is, right. It, and it, I wasn't aware again, that there was a second hair even. Yeah. And it's, and it's, it's a different, you know, you just have to be aware. It's not the type of DNA we can put into CODIS or, you know, I mean, you can do a direct comparison with people, but it's the type of DNA that we do uh, genetic genealogy with. So it can be, you could use that DNA. Let, let's say they were able to get a SNP profile from the hair and it didn't match because that would be possible that they mm -hmm. tested it and it doesn't match Terry Hobbs because maybe he's just included by coincidence. Maybe it's a long lost maternal relative or, you know, I mean, who knows? Yeah. So maybe it's not actually his. Right. So that's a that's important information to know. And then further, then let's find out whose that is through genealogy. Susanna, what about uh, like uh, genetic and uh, hair type concentrations? I mean, we're not in Los Angeles here, right, where there's um, people from all over the place coming and going. Is it likely that you're going to have more consistency, uh, like a hair that matches more people in that population because um, it's a population of people that are alike? I, I think that that's possible. And that's something that we have to be aware of when we're doing DNA testing there, you know, there can be isolated populations where, you know, we have these population frequencies that we can give you. But if you're talking about an isolated population, those frequencies don't apply. And further, like I said, this is mitochondrial DNA. So every single maternal relative of, in this case, Terry Hobbs, it's going to have the exact same mitochondrial DNA profile. And again, just by coincidence, someone might 
share the same mitochondrial profile. So while he is included, and it could be his hair, you know, I mean, it wouldn't be super surprising necessarily, given that these individuals, these kids know each other, spend time together, could be his hair. Um, but it might, it might not be as well. Um, and then the other hair that we, we didn't have him discuss is the hair that was consistent, again, mitochondrial DNA with Jacoby that was found, what, on the tree, a tree trunk? Is that, uh, is that correct? Or a tree it was, or something? It was found near? on a stump back there in those woods. Oh. And it was, and it was kind of an odd set of circumstances. It wasn't found by the crime scene investigators. It was found, my memory is telling me weeks later, might have been, mm -hmm. I think it was like six weeks later or something. And it was like wow. a, it was like a lab tech or somebody that found this hair on a stump back mm -hmm. there. The hair um, on a stump. little different That's sort of needle in a haystack. <laughs> well, and it was not, it was like, it was a ways away from, so the, the creek, there's a, a steep embankment that goes down to uh, where the creek is, where the crime scene was. It was found up the hill and, and a ways a little way from that location. Um, but also like David Jacoby is like, he was in those woods. He went in there and searched the woods. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a different situation in my opinion, if that happened to be his hair, which we don't know again because it was mitochondrial. Um, it would be a hair in a place where he said that he was, that he was. Well, right. he was confirmed by Pam and Pam's dad mm -hmm. that he he was there as as part of the search, as opposed to being tied into the knot if it's not transfer. And I know right. uh, I know Terry wasn't questioned for fourteen years, but once he was, what was his cooperation like? What did he say? What, did he willingly give any more DNA? What what's the story with Terry Hobbs? Uh, his DNA was obtained by Rachel Geyser, who was a private right. investigator working for the, um, who's amazing, by the way. Um, she was working with the investigative team on the West of Memphis documentary. Um, his, he, he gave his interview. The first, when the police interviewed him, it was, uh, ah, come on in. We got to talk to you. A couple questions. You didn't do this, right? No. Okay. Pretty much an interview like that. Uh, where we get the most detail out of him was um, when he sued the Dixie Chicks, uh, which he found was a terrible mistake because that opened him up to deposition. And right. that's where he got put to the coals was in, in a deposition. And that's where uh, he he came up with a story about that he was with David Jacoby. That he, he kind of drugged David Jacoby into this, that he was with him the whole night. You know, and then they interviewed David and he's like, no, he, I was with him for a, a little bit. Like he came in and then he left and then he came back and then I went to help him search and then he dropped me off and then he disappeared for hours. Like I wasn't with him the whole night, um, but he was, you know, he, he was, he was cooperative in the interview years later, um, but the interview wasn't, they were, they were, they were, they were checking off a box as part of the appeal um, to say, okay, we interviewed him. He's, he's cleared it, in the deposition. He didn't have a choice. What's his official timeline of the, you know, the time the last kid kids were last seen to the time their bodies are fine. Where, where is he in that timeline that we know of? He, well, according to him, he was at, he went to David Jacoby's house and was playing guitars with him. And then they together went out and were searching all night. According to David Jacoby, he came to the house played guitars uh you know the, he you know david i mean david broke down and bawled about it because he feels responsible because terry stopped in there to see if if stevie had stopped by and he said no but david convinced him to come in and and help him figure out a, a pretty woman actually on a, on the guitar uh and then terry said all right i gotta go look for him and then he said terry left and was gone for a while doesn't remember it was so many years later doesn't remember how long but he was gone for a while when he said he was going to look for stevie and then Terry came back to the house and said he hadn't found him. And David said, well, let's get in my truck and go. And then they drove around and searched for a while. That's when David found the bike track, told him that we need to drive across the, uh, to drive across the, to the other side of the bayou. Terry drops him off. Terry never comes back. And then hours later when Pam is screaming in his yard, because he had then went and um, uh, picked up Pam from work called the police was this something jim Colenti keyed in on he called the police at nine o'clock at night when he picked pam up from work from the payphone at her work not from his house and then told the police he would meet them at her work not at his house did the report there then drops pam off and then goes out and then he's gone for hours again nobody knows where he's at 
you know, he says he's out searching. Then Pam goes to David Jacoby's house screaming because her, her son was missing and Terry had left her. They start driving around again. When they finally run into Terry, he says, he asked Terry, did you go across the bayou and look where I told you where those tracks were? And Terry said, no. So David, Terry, Pam and Pam's father then finally do drive around to the other side and they go into those woods and search around for a little bit. David and Pam and her dad go straight down to the pipe to see if they can pick up the tracks on the other side. Terry, he says, wandered off into the woods by himself. Uh, and then that was it. So that was the the timeline of events per David, which is not the same timeline per Terry, who says that he was with David the entire time. So that's, that's a little bit of an issue. What was Terry's demeanor like? Did he say anything about that when he reappeared? Was he calm did he have any signs of uh he laughed blood on him anything uh his blood no he, david doesn't recall in in david david says he doesn't remember because of course the first question i asked him was when he came back after that first trip when 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 he came and said stevie was missing they played guitars and terry left for a while and came back the first question i wanted to know was had he changed clothes when he came back and david said he just he couldn't remember um mm -hmm. but certainly so there was nothing that he noticed on him that he remembered that was anything out of the, out of the ordinary. Um, as, as far mm -hmm. as his, his demeanor that night, it was, you know, he, it was, it was, according to David was, was, was unconcerned, you know, everywhere David went, David says, I find bicycle tracks. Let me follow him. Terry goes, well, I'm gonna go look over here. David follows the bicycle, bicycle tracks down to that pipe. He tells him, Hey, we got to go across there. David or Terry drops him off. And then never goes over there to look where he said the one place where there was, you know, he thought that they were, he said, Terry never went, never went over there. And again, Pam, Pam confirmed the same thing that when they found him, that that was the first thing that David said, did you go across the bridge across the other side of the pipe or other side of the bayou? And Terry had not. Interesting. Bef okay. So we're going to do a couple comments and then we're going to, um, move to the scrum which is the after hour portion before before we do sorry bob i'm gonna ask you this one more time I'm still not sure i quite understand this is very important for, for me to get an understanding of this why were they necessarily bound post-mortem uh well a couple of reasons one obviously the the markings according to the medical examiner they, they didn't have the markings they should have had were they bound perimortem to okay, the way let, they me, were... let me stop you a second though but they were put in the water unconscious right so if if, if they were drowned they would have to be then taken out and then tied and then put back in right and we know okay. that was the case we know that happened because there were sticks wrapped around those strings and then pinned down to the ground so i don't okay. think they had that set up before they drowned them could have drowned them saw that they weren't sinking and said i got to do something about this it could be but yeah it's possible um mm -hmm. the other the other the other element of that is that the the bind the I don't I don't think it's accurate to call them bindings because they didn't bind them. Again, if you imagine for an adult size, if you took a a, a string and tied it from your right wrist, and for our size, say give you three and a half foot of string and tie that to your right ankle, and the same on the other side, it doesn't stop you from running at all. I mean, it's it. It, it, it's not useful to 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 bind somebody or restrain somebody the way they were tied. Okay. Hmm. Hmm. Comments? A any good? Yeah, comments. Hmm. I'm sure we've got plenty of them. Rena Mida said, uh, so hair testing isn't as certain as blood, question mark. I thought hair was very specific considering DNA in my limited knowledge where it's done many times for employment and drugs staying in hair longer. Susanna, that one's for you. Unmute You're yourself. Muted. Unmute yourself. <laughs> um, so yes, hair testing can be as specific as blood. Uh, it just depends on what type of testing is being done. So if there's a root present and it's in the right stage of growth, so we've got some good cellular DNA adhering to that root, then yeah, that DNA profile is the same as what's in your blood, semen, saliva, muscles, whatever. It's, you know, it's all the same. However, in this case, there, there either was not a root 
or it was not in the right stage of growth, meaning this was more likely a shed head hair where it had naturally fallen out. Mm -hmm. And so in that case, there's just not enough nuclear DNA to get a regular profile. So they had to do mitochondrial DNA testing. Um, and so that is not as specific, the mitochondrial DNA. And the reason you can get a result with mitochondrial DNA, it, it, even if you can't get a result with nuclear DNA, the, cell, the, the, the DNA found in the nucleus of the cell, is because there's only two copies of nuclear DNA per cell, but there can be hundreds or even thousands of copies of mitochondria per cell. And, and mitochondria have its own DNA. It's, it's, it's separate. It's different. So that's, that's part one of your question. And then you had mentioned uh, for employment and drugs. So that's totally different. That's drug chemistry. That's looking for, you know, uh, specific traces of drugs in hairs. That's totally separate from, from DNA testing. Throw another comment up. Angela Alpen Bruce said, not to mention the knots of some of the bindings are still tied. So there is potential for more DNA to be found, exclamation mark. Absolutely. And it doesn't just like, I think that's a great spot to start is in those knots, but that doesn't mean that's the only place DNA could be found. Yes, I know this was in the water. Yes, I know it was there for, you know, over, a, I, well, actually, I don't remember the specific time, but a day, something like that, Bob, 18 is that hours. correct? 18, 18 hours about. 18 hours. Okay. So in 1993, yeah, you're not going to get results. In 2023, you probably are, and especially with the MVAC. So that's why I've been such a proponent of it. Um, you know, I, I was set to testify in the trial. I was sitting there waiting while <sighs> Bob was there in person mm -hmm. on, on Zoom, ready to go. Like, what's happening? What's, why are they not called me? What's going on? And um, I don't think that it's an I was thinking, oh, they don't want, they're, they're like afraid of the MVAC or they don't know what the MVAC is and is it going to work? And, and that turned out to not be the issue at all. And frankly, I've done MVAC testing for other agencies, law enforcement in that same county. So it's not an MVAC issue. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, just getting access to the evidence. But the MVAC itself, yeah, I, I really think that you're going to have a really good chance of getting results either, you know, from, from the shoes themselves even though they were in the water, I've gotten DNA results from a male victim from the shoes after he was, you know, thrown off of, you know, a ravine down, down a ravine into water from the seventies. We I've gotten DNA results that were CODIS eligible. Um, so it, it can happen just because it's in the water doesn't mean that, Oh, automatically the DNA is destroyed. It's, it's, not ideal. We would love it if it wasn't in water, but that doesn't mean that, that all the DNA is gone. So I think from the shoes themselves, from the shoelaces, from the sticks that someone used, someone had to use some pressure and force uh, to put mm. those sticks into the water. And so I would love to end back those. I think you have a really good chance of getting DNA results from those. Um, you know, so I, I really do think that there's quite a number of samples. And, and you know, I think that sometimes people say, oh, but you're going to get a mixture and uh, maybe it's too much DNA. I've heard that before. You'll get too much of a mixture. Well, yeah, we might get a mixture, but then we also have the boy's own DNA so we can help kind of separate that out and then look at what's left over. And with probabilistic genotyping. So some of the ways that we're able to interpret mixtures today, uh, we, we can do, even if we have a profile that we can't put into the national da database to do, you know, to search, we can definitely do a comparison to Damien and to, you know, to anyone who's been accused. We can do a comparison and say, are they included or excluded? Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I, I I'm, I'm definitely a proponent of getting that evidence and, and testing it and finding out whose DNA is present and whose isn't. And who in their so right that, mind wouldn't yeah. be a promoted of testing it. Right. Which leads me to a question. Mm -hmm. In April of 2023, the Arkansas state Supreme court overruled the lower court that said, you don't have a right to have this DNA. Has any, has there been any movement on actually getting that impact testing done or remanding, actually getting back into the lower court to hear 
the petition? That wasn't the ruling. Uh, what the ruling in April was the the state had um, put in a motion to dismiss the appeal. That's and, right. And the and the Supreme Court denied that, uh, so that they were they were they still have to go through the process, um, uh, the appeal process to get it. So there hasn't been any movement on it since then. We're waiting. They had given them sixty days, I think, to reply. We're coming up on that now. Yeah. Seems like they're it just it just seems like they're trying to punt it till it gets to the summer session when they go into recess. They just keep delaying, delaying, mm-hmm. and this is infuriating and i know i'm sure the chat is full of people who are infuriated uh and hopefully if, if some truth and justice listeners are and there's a bunch of people saying test the fucking evidence because uh yeah. mm-hmm. that's what we have been pushing over and over again because i mean you have yep there it is uh you <laughs> you have angela sorry i'll read that out for the audio listeners um bob it's um angela alpen bruce said we have said it once and we'll say it again test the effing evidence that's right. Um, you you have Damien. Damien is pushing so hard and put in in, in the, the 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 time and the energy and the emotional tax that it is putting on him desperately to test this evidence. I mean, think of the, the people that still think these guys are guilty. Jesus Christ! Look at what's happening here. If 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 this DNA comes back in anywhere, any shape or form, Damien's DNA is on there. He's done. I mean, he's not going back to prison. True, but but he is socially the way he makes his living. Everything is gone for him. Any bit of support he's ever had, because he has never met those boys. He's never been to those woods. There's no excuse for his DNA to be there. He's the one who is pushing and fighting with everything he has to test this evidence. The state of Arkansas, who has it, is fighting with everything they have to stop them from testing it. And for those that aren't aware. The reason they used to deny them the right to test it was because in the Arkansas law, it says in the the, uh, the DNA testing is listed under the habeas section. Uh, right. So so under habeas, it says you have a right to do DNA testing. When we went to that, when Susanna was waiting to testify, we were all down in Arkansas wearing our test the fucking evidence shirts, everything that was going on down there. Uh, they they said he doesn't have a right to test the evidence. Because he's not physically still in prison and habeas means show me the body. Right. And so since he's not physically in prison, he doesn't have a right to test it. And by the way, the cost to the state to do this testing is zero. My audience has pledged Mm -hmm. to pay every dime that it will take to do all of this testing. There is We've no doubt that before. <laughs> we hear that can't all the, the time. Can't the families of these boys put some pressure on the state? You know, whether it be in the press, um, going them to them directly. The family has sued the state at, at, at yeah. one point for not releasing evidence and stuff. Pam, um, Pam Hobbs did, or Pam Hicks, Hicks did. Now you have the Moors who have always maintained they think the three are guilty. Um, Christopher's mother and adoptive father are both deceased uh and so then you have pam who desperately wants to test the evidence and wants to know the truth wants to know who killed her son uh and then you have terry who has uh not been supportive of this testing at all Mm. Hmm. you know bobby said one thing that this wouldn't cost the state of arkansas a dime and you're actually wrong about that because if it clears these boys, they'll be paying huge amounts in wrongful <laughs> right. convictions. Yeah, yeah. So that's, that's what true. they're worried about. That's what they're worried about. Mm-hmm. They, you're you're exactly right, and that and that shows where the motivation is, and that gets to my yeah. point. You, if, if Damien, and, and by the way, Damien is not. It's not like he's pushing this to try to get himself out of prison. He's out of prison. He's living. He's living his life. He wants his name back. Right. Mm-hmm. And he wants the killer of those boys who stole their lives away and then stole 18 years of his life away to pay for what they did. Yeah. And, and he has the right to, to do that. Right. Yeah. What, right. And what good is, what good is having these boys blamed for the, for this crime and just saying, okay, we threw these Satan worshipers into, into prison and not catching the real killers. Don't, don't the, the people there, the, the people in authority there, don't they want the right person to Chloe pay for this a crime? Name on, nail on the head. They're, they're, they're protecting expense. their own ass. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's devil's advocate, right? At the expense of their careers and their friends' careers, 
um, their reputations. So they're just looking at it from a self-interested perspective, which is wrong. Mm -hmm. But you know, yeah, people are. I, I, I certainly don't but think I will anybody. Tell you, mm -hmm. I've run into people who have are very closely associated with this case, and they 100% believe that the that they convicted the right people. Oh, but based on what? Problem. There's no physical, no physical evidence. There's no evidence. I'm just, t you know, yeah, we people see who the... know that I worked on, you know, I did this documentary with you and I run into them at, you know, oh, yeah. at, at conferences and they've told me, you know, they're guilty. They did it. I'm like, okay, I don't know. The, but if we do the DNA testing, based, then we'll based know. On the like, physical we evidence? Do <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. And that, physical evidence. <laughs> that's my response to them always. And, and that's what, you know, the people we saw one, the one, the comment we had come up here, I'm sure the YouTube chat probably had, they, they come out when they hear anybody talking about it. The people that were a hundred percent certain in 1993 that they got the right guys over the next 30 years, they have all, they, they realize that that 90% of that information was incorrect, but yet we're still sure. But my response to them is, Cool. If you think they're guilty, then you should support testing the fucking evidence. Absolutely. Right. Right. Yeah. Let's prove and it. Let's put an I end tell... to this once and for all. Right. Because, you know, I do testing for defense. I do testing for prosecution. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter to me. But I always tell, you know, like, especially when I work for defense cases, I always say, well, listen, I will do this testing. And I'll, yeah, absolutely. But you better have a little come to Jesus moment with your client and tell, yeah. him, tell him or her that. I will get there if, if they came into contact with this, you know, if they are involved, I'm going to get their DNA. Yeah. So are you sure you want me to do the testing? And, and Bob, you know, and Bob said it pretty clearly that there's no reason Damien Eccles should be DNA anywhere on this evidence. So if it, if there or somehow is DNA of his on there one day, that will be known, but it sounds like he's pretty adamant that he, he won't have DNA found there. So I, I think they need to test his evidence. I think it's a joke that they're not doing it. Yeah. And that's the thing. People ask me all the time, cause I've worked on this case and have been so involved in it for so long who I think did it. And my response is, I don't know. Test right. the evidence. Let's mm -hmm. test the evidence and find out. I'm not going to, I'm not going to make some, 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 prediction who i think did it because it doesn't matter what i think we have mm -hmm. scientific evidence that can show us who did this go find it right so therefore um motive not really interested because at the end of the day it's beside the point who cares get around motive and... motive matters to me but it's but there's yeah. there's nothing in this case from anything we discussed today that that warrants an accusation in my opinion Okay. You know what I mean? I you, you know, to yeah, me, like, like, right. like there's a pool of suspects or persons of interest that I think fit a profile pretty well. Mm -hmm. And there's some evidence that indicates that they could be involved with it, but it doesn't warn an accusation because we don't have the physical evidence to, to confirm sure. it. And, and, and we have access to it. It's right there after mm -hmm. every year. And this process was, I could go on all night, but it was a, it was a, it was a process of them saying they didn't have the evidence, saying they lost it, telling us that it was destroyed in a fire FOIA request uh, by Marl Leverett to the fire department to confirm it certainly was not uh, destroyed in a fire. Jeez. So finally, they admitted when they were forced to by the court, oh, you know what? We found it, and guess where it was? This is pretty shocking. It was in the evidence room oh, the entire gosh. time. It's where it the evidence room. Uh -huh. Yeah, and then they let the police chief go and throw him under the bus. Yeah. And so then we're like, okay, we found And by the way, when it was missing, they said, you know, we would let you. T First of all, Ellington told us, we absolutely will send it. Remember, Susanna, we were like, we're, I oh, was yeah. asking you for your oh, yeah. FedEx numbers. Oh, yeah. He had, yeah. He had said, we need a FedEx account number. We're going to ship the evidence yep. off right now. And then he got he got a judge ship and he just stuck his head in the sand until he was gone. The next guy yeah. comes in and says, well, I would, but it's gone. And of course, we're like, what do you mean it's gone? Ellington just told us he had it. Now it's gone. We find out that was a lie. And then it's, well, well now I'm not going to let you do it. And then we go to court and that's where we sit now is in this right. appeals process. Yeah. You know, with the, the shame in all this is that these three kids that were murdered so brutally are, you know, their families are not getting any answers, not getting justice, and, and they're not getting justice. It's a, it's a real shame. If you want your heart ripped out of your chest, watch me talking to Pam Hicks in that documentary yeah. when, 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 when she just pleaded and said that she wants the truth and wants to know who killed her son, and she thinks she deserves that, and she's absolutely right. Yep. Yep. She does. Yeah. 
Well, I know you mentioned Bob about being able to talk about this all night. I want to see if you're if you're really up for that. Are you up for <laughs> after you should, hours? Uh, you gotta. I'll stronger. get you got me for a little bit. You should know it's eleven forty p.m. my time, and I did a two I'm, hour stream. I'm in the same this. time zone as yeah. you, so yeah. I'm with you. But uh, uh, four forty yeah, in the I'm morning up. here, twenty to mm. five in the morning. Four, wait, I'm 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 doing my, my other. Are you, are you in England? <laughs> Wales. Wales. I'll pretend like I know where Wales is. It's tacked right on <laughs> to England. England adjacent. England adjacent. Well, should we wrap it up and move into the scrum and uh, yeah, you know, talk some more yes. stuff? And hopefully, people come over and join us for that. Yeah, let's bring Ashley up first. I'm gonna take a little break. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Hi, everybody. Um, let's see. Oh, I'd like to thank our new digital detective agents, Kathy W. and Jody C. Uh, remember that our agents keep this podcast afloat. If you're considering joining their ranks, here's the information. The Nancy Drew tier gives you ad-free episodes, bonus content, and the scrum. The scrum is the after hours for our hosts and guests where the conversation continues. The Colombo tier contains the perks of the first plus a guarantee that at least one of your comments or voicemails <clears throat> will be heard on the show. The Poirot tier contains the perks of the first and second plus access to a quarterly private session where members will join and interact with one or more hosts to discuss cases not explored on the show. Think of it as a masterclass where you and the host dig even deeper into your pet case. The fourth and final is Sherlock Holmes, which contains all perks so far, plus a VIP pass to any special in-person event where you can meet and hang with the host of Citizen Detective. As we grow, there will be a lot more coming your way. Watch this space. Head on over to www.patreon.com slash Citizen Detective. Citizen Detective streams every two weeks on YouTube at Citizen Depod on Twitter at Citizen Detective Podcast on Facebook and twitch.tv slash Citizen Detective. Back to the show. Anybody that wants to, anybody that wants to come over, um, we'll continue the conversation over there and hopefully we have some more details to come. And I think it's worth coming over and signing up for Patreon just to see that 80s photo of me. Sign up. Come over. I need to see that photo, like now. All right, so Drew, if you can start moving us over. Thank you, everyone.